The wild animals are coming out tonight at a minor league ballpark. We'll have bats and balls and, of course, fathers and sons, fans snapping selfies and showing their colors of all kinds on the minor league baseball game of the week next on the CBS Sports Network. It is game night for the Clippers here at Huntington Park in Columbus, complete with a spectacular view of the downtown skyline. This evening, it's the Columbus Clippers hosting the Durham Bulls right here in our minor league game of the week. Hi again, everybody. I'm Dick Gabriel, along with former big league infielder Doug Flynn. And, Doug, we've been to some spectacular ballparks, but none better than Huntington Park. Dick, one of the most spectacular I've ever seen. What they have done brilliantly is they've taken bits and pieces of some of the most famous ballparks in the major leagues, They've kind of did it in a grandioso style, made it a little bit better. What do you have? You have a great ballpark. And a great game tonight. We'll see a left-hander for Durham who's got a lot of promise. Uh, Any Romero's got one of those big arms that you hear about often. The problem that he has been having is that he hasn't been able to get the ball over or throw the ball with the velocity early in the game. He throws it 95 or 96 miles an hour, but it takes him a couple innings to get loose, and he usually gets hurt before that. Columbus will counter with a right-hander who has a lot of experience at both the minor league and major league levels. Yeah, Kyle Davey is a good pitcher. He's trying to get back into the stride that got him into the big leagues. Has over 100 decisions there. He's dominated the minor leagues. Has four pitches. If he's got them working tonight, he'll be tough to hit. As we said, it's a great ballpark, and our roving reporter will take us there tonight. Lauren Gardner will show us around tonight. Lauren. Well, hello, gentlemen. When Huntington Park opened in 2009, it was voted ballpark of the nation, beating out Yankee Stadium and New York Mets City Field. And this place has all the amenities of a modern stadium, but also boasts some very iconic features that make this place really unique. And gentlemen, throughout tonight's broadcast, I'm going to personally take you to all of the places throughout Huntington Park that really give this place some personality. It's a great place to watch a great game, and we'll have it next. The minor league baseball game of the week coming up on the CBS Sports Network. Perfect ball game weather here in Columbus, Ohio. Wind blowing out. Maybe we'll see the long ball this evening. Here's the way the Durham Bulls will come to the plate. Hack lead will lead things off. He's listed as the number two prospect in the entire system. Wilson Bedham at the cleanup man has reached in 34 of 38 games this year. In the eight hole, Mike Fontenot has a ring from the Giants in 2010. Kyle Davies on the bump for Columbus. And as Doug pointed out, he has been up to the majors. He's got major league stuff. And he wants to get back, obviously, Doug, and needs more consistency. Well, he does, Dick. We talked with uh, manager Chris Premier before the game, and he likes this kid. Uh, he's got all the physical tools. He's got four pitches, those fastball, curve, slider, changeup. His problem has been consistency and being able to throw every pitch over when he needs to. But that's why you're here. So Hack Julie, the left-handed hitter tonight, will lead things off. For Durham, and we are underway with Davies, who was known as one of the baby Braves back when he first came up with Atlanta. That'll find foul ground on the left field line, and behind that left field wall, as Lauren pointed out, a lot of fans in a special spot. We'll see a lot of that tonight. You see it on the left field line. Fans on the balconies, fans on the berm. Beyond the left center field wall, there's a good look at Lee. We watch batting practice, and the ball will fly out of this ballpark. And he goes the other way, first base runner of the night. He considered the best defensive player in the organization for Tampa Bay and all of the Rays minor league teams. Take a look at how Columbus will play defense tonight across the outfield. Elliot Johnson, Matt Carson in center field, Carlos Moncrief in right. Around the horn, Ushela, Ramirez, Rollinger, Aguilar at first, George Cotteris behind the plate. All in defense of Kyle Davies. And Aguilar and Ramirez back down from the big leagues. They've been up there for a while. Got sent down, so we had a couple go up. We had a couple come down. Now Jason Nix with a runner on, nobody out, just underway here in Columbus. Clippers play up to the Cleveland Indians for the longest time. They've played as the Triple-A team for the New York Yankees. 
made for some interesting times. We'll find out more about that as the evening wears on. Well, how about the alumni that came through there? Oh, my goodness. You know, we look at Hak Ju Lee. He's attempting to become only the third Korean born Major League position player in the history of Major League Baseball. So baseball certainly has gone international. A lot of pitchers, but not many position players. Now we saw a player in our first week up in Pawtucket, born in Italy, who had made it to the bigs. Good breaking ball. One of those four pitches we talked about. Doesn't throw over uh, exceedingly hard. 87 to 91 is what we were told. Next goes 5'11", 195. He was born in Dallas. You know, a lot of these players with some big league experience off and on, Nick, six seasons. But still that hope of getting back to get finish up those 10. Lee had broken, all but broken for second. And then Davies crossed him up by stepping off the rubber. I tell you, he did a good job of stepping off in that balking there. Sounds easy to do, but it is not. Jammed him, but he turned on it. Lee's going to make the turn. He'll go into third easily. Up with the ball is Johnson. And a double now for Jason Nix. But you pointed out, Doug, sometimes despite his big league capabilities, Davies gets himself in trouble. Well, you look at that pitch. That's just right up in the zone. It's not hard enough to blow him away. And he gets a fastball up where he can see it good and turn on it. And already we've seen some offense, and that's a little unusual when these two teams play, Dick, because they don't average a lot of runs. Between them, they averaged in a four-game series earlier this year, which they split four and a half runs. And each shut the other out at some point. So now Mikey Matuk, former star from LSU, born in Lafayette, Louisiana. Played on the Tigers 2009 College World Series championship team. Boy, swinging the bat good, too. He's hit safely in nine of his last ten games. There's that good breaking ball, the off-speed pitch by Davies. He's in trouble here in the first. Montauk drafted out of high school in the 39th round by Seattle. Did the wise thing, went to LSU, then worked his way up through the minor league chain spent last year with the Montgomery Biscuits just another <laughs> terrific minor league name well so far I think Iron Pigs might be my best that's that's maybe my favorite that's pretty good Matuk stays alive the 303 average 18 runs batted in Well, just look. fabulous. Isn't it? This I was is say, it's a great look at this great ballpark and a wonderful night for baseball. There's a straight change that he tried to get him on. And you're right, it's pleasant. They've been putting a lot of people in this park, too. Averaging somewhere close to 9,000. Started construction on this park in 2007. As Montuk drives at the center, Carson on the run. He won't catch up to that. Two runs will score. Matuk takes a look, but he'll stay at second base. Back to back doubles now and a 2 nothing lead for Durham. So none of this low scoring stuff apparently for the Bulls, at least not tonight. No, and two pitchers that if you get to them early, but you see where all of his misses are. They're up in the zone. If that pitch is down, he had good location away, but that pitch is just up where good hitters are going to be able to handle it, and he certainly does. So a pair of runs batted in for Matuk. He has 20 on the year now. And a 2 nothing lead for the visitors. As Wilson Bediment stands in, he has reached safely, as we said earlier, 34 of his last 38 games. From Santo Domingo. Kid's been up in the big leagues quite a bit. I thought when I first saw him, he was going to be one of those can't-miss players. But he came up, and he's got... He had a 267 lifetime in the big league, so you know, 
Swings a bat pretty good. Got a chance to be the regular third baseman with the Dodgers back in 07, but just couldn't quite sustain it. And an interesting story. He signed with the Braves at age 14 and a half. I don't believe that's legal. Yeah, it was not. They were not know at the time. Oh, oh they got him picked off. Ah took slips away. Now they got it. Well, just a good pickoff from the shortstop put the daylight play on that time. Not a very smart run, really, and I'm sure that if you had to go down and talk to Matuk, he'd tell you the same thing. No outs. And you watch the rundown. You'd like to do it in one or two throws. He gets him there, but even if he didn't, he was out of the baseline. Right. All you have to do is make an attempt. <laughs> There's nowhere to go in that situation, <laughs> but. You were in plenty of situations like that as a defensive player and in a minute I'll get you to explain just what goes into a play like that that almost looks routine but it's anything but towering pop up battling the sun is Johnson and there are two outs and again you played both sides of that second base shortstop and second well the do idea they, is to get the run to go to the shortstop. Well, it, it, the shortstop put a daylight play on that time, which means he's throwing his glove on the base side of the runner. And when that pitcher sees that, that means there's some daylight there. And so that's where they got the play. And he turned and wheels. Sometimes you do it on a count. You say on three uh, after you turn back to the batter. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. So it really doesn't matter if it's second base with a shortstop. What you don't want to do, though, is make five or six throws. You right. want to get the runner going in a certain way so that he can't stop, and then your other defensive player comes to you. Jerry Sands stands in now with two outs, and, of course, you want to get him going back to the bag, not moving forward. Exactly. That time they were just, <laughs> hey, I've seen that play run going forever. You get a guy like Billy Hamilton in there, somebody could really run. Sands out of Catawba College, taken in the 25th round by the Dodgers. In 08. Well, he put on a show in bad practice today. Man. Really came alive in 2010 in the Midwest League with great Lex. He did a lot of that. A lot of that in BP. And, yeah. you know, he'd been struggling as of late. But, boy, it doesn't show on that. That's just a very good swing. And if you watch him take BP today, he's only 13 for 77 in his last 18 games. But he figured something out today in batting practice. Wow, fourth Big, strong kid too. Fourth base hit of the inning. But thanks to the rundown and the pickoff of Matsu, it's only a two nothing lead for Durham as Vince Belnome stands in. Coatesville, Pennsylvania attended West Virginia University. Taken in the 28th round by San Diego, traded him to Tampa Bay in December of 2012. Trying to work his way up. Davies surrendered a single and back to back doubles. The RBI double by Mikey Matuk, but then Davies picked him off. Another good curveball. Yep. Well, we were told that he has four pitches that he can usually throw pretty consistently uh, when he's on. But when you look at his record, he has dominated. You see the dimensions there of the uh, this beautiful ballpark. I tell you, the gaps are not very deep, but it gets deep in center field. And the wind is blowing out 13 to 15 miles an hour. It looks like it's picked up a little bit since the game began. It's been breezy all day here in Columbus, but. Just enough to keep it really comfortable and again a great crowd here almost a full house. The place holds 10,100. How about this setting we have sitting outdoors tonight in an outdoor box and it's fantastic. Open air they call it. Speaking of Mikey Matuk and LSU there aren't many open air boxes like this last time I worked one was a college game in Baton Rouge in the old Alex Box Stadium. But you can do that when you have great weather. Yeah. This is fabulous. 
Runner goes, but that's ball four. And now two men on again. And it's been a long inning for Kyle Davies. Yeah, it really has. You know, when he's missed, he hasn't missed badly, but he has missed up. And most pitching coaches will tell you they'd rather be missing down or a little bit out of the zone. And when he has missed it, it's hurting. Coming up here now on his 27th pitch, and then going to have a little talk. See if we can't figure this thing out. Justin Christian is waiting for his at bats, but first to visit. That's Tony Arnold, pitching coach. Yep. Working under manager Chris Trimmy. Hitting coach for Columbus is Jim Rickon. Tony with a couple of years in the big leagues and then turned his attention towards coaching in the minor leagues out of Texas. With the University of Texas at Austin that ought to make some of our crew happy. Yep. Our Longhorn fans. Justin Christian really an interesting story started off at Skyline College. Signed with Auburn but suffered a torn labrum transferred to Southeast Missouri State where he was an All-American. A good slow curve by Davies. Despite his college resume, was not drafted, so he went and played in the Frontier League. Arranged a couple of big league tryouts, didn't work out for him. Back to the Frontier League as the bullpen comes alive now for Columbus. But that second spell in the Frontier League worked out. He batted 450. And the New York Yankees signed him sight unseen. How about that? That's pretty good. Yeah. And, and very unusual too. And was called up to the Yankees at one point. It's like Austin Adams going down to get loose. Right hander. Davies still struggling. Top of the first inning. Two on, two out, but two in. Christian just staying alive. And that was a good 0-2 pitch. That was down a little bit. Christian does a good job of just fouling it off. Seems like Davies has prospered with the breaking ball, but he can't make a living with it, as we say. Just here in the first inning, they'll start to sit on it. Well, they will, and the ones that he's missed with Dickman right across the plate, but you can see, though, when he has, if he were to have control of it, he's got a good breaking ball. High fast. Finally ends the inning on a high fast ball that Christian wishes that he had back, but. The Bulls rough up Kyle Davies with a couple of doubles. They drive in two. We'll go to the bottom of the first. Durham two, Columbus coming up on the minor league game of the week here on the CBS Sports Network. Two nothing Durham leading the Clippers who will bat for the first time. And here's the way they'll come to the plate. Jose Ramirez will lead things off for the home team. You see Aguilar batting cleanup tonight. Matt Carson in center field. Ryan Rollinger in the eight hole. George Cotteris batting ninth. And they will be facing this young man. Eddie Romero making his ninth start with that two and four average, 43 strikeouts, but he's walked 20 in those 41 innings. Wow. But I tell you, I talked to Neil Allen, the pitching coach, former teammate of mine. And he says this kid Doug has a big big arm. His problem is he goes the first couple of innings and he hits 90 or 91 and then if he doesn't get in too much trouble and he's still in the game in the third fourth and fifth inning he can get it up to 96 as high as 97 Dick. So what he'd like to see him do is come out and show some of that good hard stuff early. Well we'll see if his control is good enough early so where Columbus doesn't hurt him the way the Bulls roughed up Kyle Davies is. Jose Ramirez stands in. And that first pitch at 89 mile an hour. Ramirez is a switch hitter, 5'9, 165. Back down from the bigs from the Dominican Republic. Kind of reminds you a little bit of David Price. Big lefty over the top, who has certainly had a tremendous career. Ramirez just two for 25 in his stay with the big club in 11 games. Prior to that, was tearing it up down here, batting 319 for Columbus. 
in 23 games with four homers, 17 runs batted in. Lifts it high to right field. That is deep. And off the wall. And it's doubles night here at Huntington Park, the third we've seen tonight. <laughs> well, he was throwing fastballs pretty much by him, tried to come back with a breaking ball. And this breaking ball, you can see a little slider. Looks like a pretty good pitch down, but as you said, this kid has been red hot when he has been playing here. You heard the fans get excited. We mentioned the wind blowing out, and Ramirez really shoved that thing into right. Jerry Sands knew he didn't have a play on it in right field, so played it well off the wall. So a runner at second now with nobody out for Elliot Johnson. Johnson 333 so far this season. Two nothing lead for Durham here in the first. A long first inning for the Bulls. Good 93 mile an hour fastball right there. Boy, it looks easy gas too. You know, it looks like it's effortless when it comes out of his hand. There's a lot of slang around the ballpark, and easy gas is probably the most self-explanatory. <laughs> well, you can see when he throws his changeup like that one there, he really tries to turn it over almost like a screwball, slows his arm action down a lot. Wouldn't chase it. A lot of movement. Johnson from Safford, Arizona. Another switch hitter. Signed by Tampa Bay back in 2002. He's a non drafted free agent. They found him at a Super 50 All Star game in Arizona. Back in 06, he had a huge game for the Montgomery Biscuits. Next day, on the diamond, proposed to his wife. Wow, good breaking ball there. Had him set up just right. He was working the count pretty good, and then he just comes back with a hard slider that you're not looking for with a 3 2 count. Strikeout right number one for Romero. I asked Neil Allen if he was working with these kids on a curveball that he used to throw so well. He said they still don't believe I pitched in the big leagues. <laughs> Giovanni Urshela signed on with Cleveland in 08 as a non drafted free agent. And a quick confab between Kirk Casale, the catcher, and the six foot three Romero. And you can see as he unfolds that big frame, Doug, that's where. A lot of that velocity comes from. Yeah, he's got the perfect size for a pitcher. 6'3, about 220, and you know, his mechanics look pretty good. And they're very high on this young man. Jammed him. That one easy 95 mile an hour. So we're seeing the heat prior to the second and third innings. And you see that ball with movement. He's shown us that he can turn it over, make it go the other way. That time he cuts a fastball, comes right in under his hands. Shayla from Cartagena in Colombia. Hey, romance in the zone. There you go. It's exactly what I think of. Still the best one of those movies. The, the, the first one usually is, yes. though, right? Yes, unless you're talking about The Godfather. Ooh. Well, one and two, I like three. I didn't no, think it was a good. No, you can have that one. This is absolutely fabulous. When I look around here, you know, and we're going to talk more about it, but I just see pieces of so many ballparks that I respect <laughs> and like. Here's the one two. Lee with a big hop. Boy, I tell you what, that's a ground ball where the sun almost got in his eyes. If you can believe that. That ball took a big hop 
And he almost turned his head away he from it. He did turn his head. Watch it. You watch it. He sort of back. Wow. His head is looking almost to third base. And he does a great job of, of getting it. The sun is right in his face, right? I tell you, I thought he may have laid back a little bit, but he showed us that he's got a good, strong arm as well. Well, it's interesting because when he plucked the ball out of the air with his glove, he was also shielding his eyes. So great play by Lee. Now Jesus Aguilar steps in. The runner at second now and two out. Take another look at Lee and how he tried to help himself here. All right, he stays back on the ball first. Wow. He shields himself. Just hoping that the ball is going to go in his glove, but he pretty much set it where he thought it was going to be. That's just a good job. 1 0 pitch. And then again, if he doesn't catch it, it hits him right square in the head. We were talking movies, of course. America fell in love with minor league baseball thanks in large part to the movie Bull Durham. We were wondering last night do any of these players even know what that is it came out so long ago and it's just a classic movie about baseball in general minor league baseball specifically. And Lauren had a chance to talk to some of the players about it so we'll hear about that a little bit later in the telecast. You know as a former player you're watching that and you're saying I right, can this be believable or not. And you like a movie that at least you can go back to and say yeah that might have happened or some of the terminology like yeah. meat. Oh yeah. You know that kind of stuff. Now written by a former minor leaguer himself. Cast perfectly there just weren't any weak spots in that film. If you're a baseball fan you had to love it and it's always a part of the debate and discussion about What's your favorite, favorite baseball, baseball movie? movie. Yeah. <laughs> With me, it's like, well, what, what's the one I just saw? You know? Wow, good heat there. 92, he stayed consistently. 91, 92. Occasionally, he's got it up to 95. Here's a fastball that just paints the oh, corner. Nasty. That may have been a slider. No, it was a fastball. It's 92, I think. Not too many people throw sliders 92 was miles about an hour. I to say, he'd be. Uh, Richard. He'd be chauffeured back to the bigs <laughs> if he could do that. Full count. Now two on and two out for Columbus. Ramirez led off with the double. Romero retired the next two, but probably being careful with Aguilar, maybe a little too careful. I think you're exactly right. It's twice he's had full counts on hitters, though, and thrown them breaking balls. One he got away with, ball in the dirt and a strikeout. That time, a kid with a little more big league experience. Now David Cooper, DH tonight, listed as a first baseman, six foot, 200 pounds. Lefty lefty matchup. He has the opportunity to at least put his team on the board now. Native of Stockton, California. But only bats 184 against lefties. It's amazing. Also talking with pitching coach Neil Allen about the arm strength of some of these kids. I said, Neil, do these guys really throw that hard? And he says, Doug, they do. I said, I thought it was just the gun. He said, no, they, they're legitimately up there in the 90s. And then you come back with a good breaking ball like that. Wow. Cooper, a former first round pick in 08. Out of Cal Berkeley, 17th pick overall, taken by the Blue Jays. Transfer to Cal from Cal State Fullerton. He was part of the 06 College World Series team, all tournament team. Goes the other way, but foul. Had a big year last year with Columbus, 314. Dick, that's just what uh, we were talking about. That pitch was 97 miles an hour. So you give Cooper credit just for being able to get a piece of it. Well, you got to be ready for the breaking ball, too, because he's got a one and two count, so he's really got the hitter exactly where he wants him. Looks like another slider. Yep. Ramirez at second, Aguilar at first. 
Clippers have worked Romero, but they haven't reached him yet for a run here in the first. Wow. Second strike out of the inning. And Columbus strands two. We'll go to the second. Durham two, Columbus nothing. Back with more of the minor league game of the week on the CBS Sports Network. Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn in Columbus, where the Bulls are taking a 2 0 lead on the Clippers. Be sure you're with us next Thursday, May 29th. Go we'll ahead to Tennessee, where the Iowa Cubs travel to Memphis to take on the Redbirds. It's the Minor League Baseball Game of the Week at 8 p.m. Eastern on CBS Sports Network. And there you see the spectacular sight we have the view here at Huntington Park. The Bulls back at it. Against Kyle Davies, they roughed him up in the first inning for four hits, two runs. He helped himself by picking off a runner. Now, Mike Fontenot. We talked about where the name came from, Huntington Ballpark. And we were advised it was Huntington Bank. Yep. Great corporate sponsor here. Fontenot with a World Series ring. He was with the Giants in 2010. Made an official appearance, but was sent to the plate as a pinch hitter. High and deep, but foul. On his way to the plate, he got called back because of a pitching change. So he officially was in the game, but never got to the plate. It was still part. He got of further than I got in two <laughs> World Series. I'll well, tell you, you were that. on deck one night. I was I on deck, but wasn't officially now. Right. Was that game six? It was game seven. Game seven. In the top of the ninth inning. Not a bad piece of hitting a on a one two pitch. For the second time in as many innings, Durham puts the leadoff man aboard. So more pressure on Kyle Davies. He's through 31 pitches in inning number one as Kurt Casale stands in. Out of Walnut Creek, California, 6'2, 225. 303 average. So Davies back to working out of the stretch. There's a good hard slider that he throws. But most of his pitches tonight have, have been up. Durham's taking advantage. That's a good fastball that he runs in. Still about belt high. He'd like to have that down just a little bit. Those are being managed tonight by Dave Myers, the third base coach. Charlie Montoyo attending the graduation of a family member, longtime manager, and very successful for Durham. Nice pickup by Yershela. 5 4 3. Despite the hard slide by Fontenot. That's the way you draw it up right there. Well, if you can get a good throw from your third baseman or shortstop, Fontenot has a little lap. If you're going to get taken out, that's the size guy you want to take you out on a double play. <laughs> but this ball was hit right on the nose. Just a good play. Personally, gets it over. Nice, nice turn. You saw Ryan Rollinger trying to get out of the way, but found no the clean slide. It's a lot to think about out there if you use second baseman with somebody barreling in on you. You know, not really. Because uh, if you start thinking, then you really get in trouble. <laughs> so you try to practice it enough times where you don't have to yeah. think, you just react. Hak Julie singled, scored a run back in the first. What's that they said? One of those baseball movies? Quit thinking you only hurt the team. That's right. So you were a better ball player when you stopped thinking? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> well, some would argue that I never started thinking. But I would try to practice like game situations. So when it came up, I really didn't have to think about what to do. Muscle memory. Muscle memory. It was very simple. Catch the ball, look for the runner's head, throw it at the head. 
The rest you, is up to him. Well, usually the head was right between you and the first base bag. So if I threw it at the head, it was going to be a perfect throw. Good inning for Davies. Rocked in the first, but sharp in the second. We'll go to the bottom of the inning. Durham with a 2 0 lead here in Columbus. Back with more of the minor league game of the week. Back at Columbus, Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn. We mentioned Dave Myers is in charge tonight for Durham. Earlier, he talked with our Lauren Gardner. Well, gentlemen, the team flight was a bit lighter this morning as the Durham Bulls made their way here to Columbus, Ohio. That's because manager Charlie Montoyo was absent and the interim manager stepping in here is Dave Myers. Dave, where is Charlie this afternoon and how is that going to affect the team this evening? Well, it shouldn't affect the team. I, I've stepped in for Charlie before, but uh, Charlie's at home. Uh, I believe he had an appointment with his son, so uh, it was kind of a scheduled thing, and uh, we, we knew it was coming, so we're prepared for it. Anything different you plan on doing with this club here tonight? No. <laughs> no, just uh, uh, we know what our game is, and if we play it, we're, we're pretty good, and if we don't, uh, we're not that good. So uh, uh, it's going to be business as usual here tonight. And the keys to taking on the Clippers this evening are what? Well, I think we need to get a, a good start out of our starting pitcher out of Romero, and uh, we need to to uh, hit effectively with men in scoring position. Uh, the days we do those two things, we're, we're a pretty good club. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, folks. And we're joined now in the booth by Jack Hanna, who is the director emeritus of the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. And you've seen him dozens of times. Do you know how, how many times you've been on Letterman show? Well, they say 95. We did it Monday, but I don't really don't know because we did a lot of other shows. It's well over 100. But that's you know I've just had loved doing it for almost 30 years now, and uh, he loves the animal world, promoted the animal world. Now he really likes animals. As a matter of fact, I don't say this very often. I've never talked to Dave before or after the show in the <laughs> entire time I've been on there. Really? He's really a a giving person and once you know him you'll understand that but now he, he's actually studied animals and it scares me because I go in there and he knows <laughs> what I know. Do you look for ways to, to spook him? You know I don't look for him it just things happen you know it's one of those deals that it works you know people that say what I'm going to do now he's leaving I don't know if uh, Colbert or whatever his name is, is is like Dave then I'll probably hang around a little while but <laughs> you know Dave and I are the same age but he's, again he really loves the animal world now because of his son Harry I think. You didn't bring anything out here to surprise us did you? My wife. It's a joke. It's a joke. Okay, it's a joke. She's not here, so I can get away with it. Hey, I will tell you, I had a chance to visit that wonderful place that you're a part of, and had so much to do with the wild. Oh gosh, that's that's people, fabulous, and no, it, people really don't know about it yet. Exactly, they don't. It's the largest conservation center in the world, private one, 10,000 acres, 110 lakes, the second longest zip line in the country. Animals that we no use going over here because people would never heard of them. That's true. It, it's unbelievable. It, the whole thing is like a dream to me to take a strip mine. In 1978, when I came here and, and do what we've done today, is phenomenal. Now it's just people are coming from all over the world to see it. I love it. Now, how's your arm feel? Out there, look pretty good out there on the yeah, mound today. Did. Well, let me show you. I used to catch in high school. I went yeah. Back, but feel that right there. See there, that bone. It, coming, oh yeah, yeah that, that'll do it. And I'm old. That bone's coming out of my shoulder here. There oh you my go. Running start. That's you pretty got good. It there, see though. what happened? Well, I flew the ball out of Cleveland. The guy told me to throw it hard over his head. Dad coming out, throw it hard. It didn't. I didn't believe him. <laughs> and the dirt. 30 feet for the mound. I said, I went, and I was practicing avocado in the parking lot the whole time. So I said, tonight I'm not going to screw up. Well, they always say that in throwing out the first pitch, it's much better to throw it too high than too low. You knew who I met in the 1950s? About baseball story. I met Willie Mays in Knoxville, Tennessee, the Knoxville Smokies, a little minor league team. I'll never forget as long as I live meeting Willie Mays. I can't find wow. the dad gum Bali sign. Oh, oh. I know, with, I know. Talking with Jack Hanna, uh, again, you've seen him. 95 times on the Letterman <laughs> show, and uh, you're part of the Columbus community. Why are you here tonight? Well, tonight, you know, I came to the Clipper Stadium in 1978. Was over at Cooper Stadium. I'll never forget as long as I ever live. Uh, Schnocky, he's a, he's been a buddy of mine. He and I came the same year, basically. He came a year before me, the GM there, and, and he's always been so good. And the Clippers just, I, I love the downtown area, and I just can't believe this field here. It's part of Columbus. The Clippers have been, it's like the Columbus Zoo, you know, it's part of our history here. We've talked about so many of the alumni that have gone through the organizations that have been here. And this is one of the most fabulous ballparks, big league or minor leagues, that I believe I've ever been a part of. Well, thank you very much because I feel the same way. When this thing was built, 
I kept saying, oh, they can't, you know, because I'm from Tennessee, by the way. I mean, they play baseball with cow things. <laughs> well, we're from Kentucky. <laughs> oh, I'm so. sorry. Well, gosh, I married, I married my cousin. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, what's that? Uh-oh. That could be That's wrong. way out of here. That's what Dang. you call a big fly. Holy mackerel. Carlos Moncrief has tied the game. That's unbelievable. That ball was about 100 feet in the air. I, I, I I, I'm sorry. I don't see much baseball. Is that a high home run or that, what? That is a long, high, Golly deep home run. Dang. Holy mac! Does he do this a lot, that player? Uh, I don't, it, I, I if he keeps doing it, he won't be here long. We'll tell <laughs> you that. The walk to Matt Carson comes oh, back to dang. haunt Romero. It's a tie game. You know, we talked about early, Jack, with these two teams. When they play, they only average four and a half runs for the both of them. We've already got four runs here. Good We're, night. So this is kind of an unusual game for these two teams. Is that going to be, I was coming back from Africa, I heard about this college team that went like 24 innings or something several weeks ago. Good night. Oh, uh, I know. Tell us about that, your trip to Africa and how awful. Well, well, there's another hard hit ball by geez, Ryan Rawlinger into the right corner, cut off by Jerry Sands. He'll have a play. Oh. A double for Rawlinger. So I'd, I'd like to think you went to Africa to look for wild animals. Yeah, you know, people think I come back with animals in a box, but really 98% mm. of our animals are zoos, but 98% come from other zoos. If I need an animal like a cheetah or whatever, all I got to do is go take my veterinarian, collect the sperm and the eggs from the animal, and come back with it. The zoo world today is much different. Last year, you may not know this, 176 million people went to zoos, bigger than NASCAR wow. or anything. It's amazing what's happened here in our country. I'm a big zoo guy. I, I can't wait to see your zoo. Well, you, uh, and you got to come up and see it. I will, and I know some people object to that. The animals are, you know, but they live yeah. a good life. Trust they, me. I, I, get, I did 29 cities today around this country for the satellite tour for opening of Africa today, and I, I have no problem. I think debate, debate the best of the animal rights guys. It's very simple. They live better than most people. Thank you. These animals, <laughs> these animals, I swear, they, I, I, I know I would not be involved. I thought any animal was being harmed. Can you imagine having a veterinarian, your medical care, your food, you go on a breeding loan? They can go on a breeding loan, like go to California or Australia. I mean, not a bad gig. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. It, it was it Jason Dromino over at uh, the Wilds? And you had. Oh, Jason, uh, yeah. How many? You got uh, eight, ten white rhino? Yeah, the largest. The largest. We have four to five generations now. No one in the history of the world in a zoological setting has that. We have the wilds, as you know, have the wild dogs, the talking for China, yeah. the largest herd in the world. You talk about this. Tell me about that animal a little bit. The talking, T-A-K-I-N. It's found with the giant pandas are at high altitudes where you can't even see them. We have the largest herd in the world outside of China. The Chinese come to our place to study them. Wow. So people ask about what the zoological parks do. You, I guarantee you, we can now prove that several animals, not several, quite a few in the world would not be here today if it wasn't for the zoo throughout this country. Wow. Wow. In the American Zoo and Aquarium Association, with all the support we have, the species survival plan, it's a very complicated thing, everyone, what we do today to keep these animals. For, look at these kids out here. That's what it's all about, not about me or people my age group. Well, and I, I grew up in Louisville, which I think has a very fine zoo, and they That's were beautiful. one of the first zoos yep. to have the natural habitats. And now I think yep. practically everybody, it's not just an animal sitting there in a cage. It's like they're in their natural habitat, which has been a great development. It's amazing you know that because that, it really is. The Louisville Zoo had a guy, I can't remember, he was from Europe. He brought over, see, Europe had the first moats and the first things in the world. Then they, that your, his zoo, the Louisville Zoo, was the first ones to put the moat system in, along with yes. Milwaukee and a few of them. And that's how it all started. It's amazing you know that because I can't believe <laughs> he knows, you know the zoo world. <laughs> well, he, Saw a nice he's zoo? kind of an animal himself, that's well, why. There you go. <laughs> I don't live as well as Jack Hanna's animals. I can tell you that. No, it's not a reflection on my wife. Either. No, hope you guys can come up there. Really, the CBS guys, we invite all of them up there in the Mirfield yep. tournament next week. Next Wednesday, we have a party, not for guys like yourself. They, they have their own party. Do I bring in all the truck drivers? Another, another hard one? hit ball. Jose Jeez. Ramirez, but this will stay in the ballpark. Mikey Matuk, and he keeps Ryan Rollinger at second base. Well, I definitely want to come back to the Wilds, and I was fortunate to go up with Mr. Nick Popa, who took me up there, who's uh, with Pepsi, well, I'm gonna put him in. The, well, I'm gonna put him in the doubt. The wilds to live. Nick, uh, oh, are you? Oh, I know Nick for 25 years. Good night. Isn't he wonderful? Oh, I love him. He he was great, but he took us up. We got a chance to fish one of the lakes. They have what 60 fishable lakes out of 120. Exactly. And the bass up there are anywhere from four to 12 pounds. That's right. Unbelievable. Wow. They they are saying that the state record will come there for one day. Exactly right. That's what's gonna happen. So, where, where are you all from here? 
Actually, we are home base is Lexington. Lexington. Yeah, That's we're not beautiful. too far away. Yeah. That's beautiful. I don't know that horse that won that thing, but I was coming back on a plane. California <laughs> Chrome. Hey, I'm talking about an animal who lives well. Yeah. Thoroughbreds, Thoroughbreds live like your animals. Yeah, you tell if people are against horses and they say, oh, the horse is mistreated. I've been down to Kentucky. I've seen those, <laughs> those farms. Are you kidding me? That stall looks like a $500,000 house. My That's producer good. wants to know, have you put any nasal strips on your animals to help them breathe like they do with a horse? <laughs> <laughs> We're no, talking. I, since I'm about to be 60 years old, I put them on my own self to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> talking with Jack Hanna from the Columbus Zoo. And, again, a great place. You could make Columbus could be a destination stop for vacationers. Come catch a ball game. See there? Go to That's the right. zoo. People don't realize it now what's here. You know, I got made, people made fun of me in the 1970s, early 80s. But they say, why don't you go to New York, L.A., do your show? Are you kidding me? We do three national shows on the That's Columbus right. Zoo little old yurt I have up there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our open and closes are there. But Columbus, I raised my family here. This hospital, next to my children's hospital, mm -hmm. saved my daughter's life twice. She's wow. had cancer, and she wow. still does. She's 37. Your heart. Brain tumors at the point. We all have issues. But I owe this city my daughter's life. I owe this city or my dream of being a zookeeper, much less. I never wanted to be on TV. You know, I used to watch, maybe you're my age, Marlon Perkins Wild Kingdom. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. All I want to do is leave Tennessee. No, I love Tennessee, but I just want to, you know, get across the border. Right. But today, I've been so blessed to travel the world, every continent in the world, so many times to bring people to the animal world. And I'm just, you know, I owe that to a lot of people here. Yeah, but it shows in your work, Jack. I mean, it's obvious you love what you do, and it shows when you're on television. You yeah. say you don't like TV. TV likes you, though, I know, I'll tell you that. I never look at the ratings or money or nothing else. I just have fun doing it. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> and my dad were alive. He died very early in life. and. But he was a great athlete. He played, was captain of football and basketball at Vanderbilt in the 30s. And, wow. You know, I just wish he could have seen what I do, but he didn't. You were hanging out with Betty White today. Yeah, Betty has been a buddy of mine since 1979. She came here for a Loves play. animals. Oh, my God. You, she doesn't have children, and she is a person. I'm t not because of who she is and why she came here, because we've just been good friends. She said, Jack, i got to see Africa. We never got there. That was a high ball there, whatever that is. Barry Sands again. But, That'll do it. Yep. Yeah. But she really is a person that you would, you would, there's not an in you, Betty, Betty White represents what I wish there were more Betty Whites in the world. We would not have the problems today. She loves animals and everything else. Jack Hanna, thanks for joining Thank us. All. I appreciate it. Great to meet you. Nice to see you guys. Thank you, Jack. I will take you on tour at my zoo. All we'll right, get buddy. There. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Moncrief with a big fly for Columbus. We've got a tie game. Back with more on the CBS Sports Network. Back in Columbus where the Bulls and Clippers are tied at two. Yeah, it's Columbus. It's not Boston, but a little piece of it looks like Boston, Lauren, doesn't it? Oh, it certainly does, Dick. This measures at 22 feet, a little bit shorter than the real thing at Fenway Park, just over 37 feet. It was originally supposed to extend all the way up through the second level, but President and General Manager Ken Schnocky decided, hey, this looks like a pretty good place to watch the game from, and indeed it is. I'm not in jail here. They have these cutouts. They call them knot holes, guys, and the best part about this, get this, these seats are free. They're not even seats. I'm actually outside of the ballpark, so people can walk by, ride their bikes by. Uh, kids can come over, watch the game, and I can tell you this is a really cool perspective to watch a ball game from, and uh, maybe you can come let me out of jail later. Well, I got bad news, Lauren. There, there are no pass outs here at this stadium, so We'll catch you later. I forgot to get my stamp <laughs> to return into the gate. No, that is such a great feature. As she said, knot holes are absolutely that. That's a throwback, as you know, Doug, to the old days when they had the wood slats around right. the outfield and they had actual knot holes that kids would come up and there's paintings and drawings of kids catching a game for free from the outfield and just another outstanding characteristic of this ballpark. There's not a lot that they didn't think about when they put this together. Uh oh, we got to play. No. Ken Schnocky's going to join us a little bit later, but he, the ballpark's been open for, what, this is its sixth year. Sixth year. He's still like a kid with a new toy. He really is, and that's good because they know they've done a very good job yes. of putting this together, and they're anxious to show it off to everyone. Well, Jason Nick standing in. He double scored a run back in the first inning, and Kyle Davies with a 1-2-3 inning thanks to a double play back in the second. We've talked about it before. Still, probably the cheapest form of really good entertainment that you will ever be able to go see anywhere. And the prices here are the lowest that I've heard anywhere in the country. Jesus Aguilar squeezes one down. You can get in this place for three bucks. Three bucks. Are you kidding me? 
You can't go buy a drink, soft drink anywhere for three bucks or a cup of coffee anymore. So while you're in Columbus, ladies and gentlemen, take in the zoo. Yep. Get some fishing done at the wild. There's the berm in left center field. Zip lining, the longest zip line. Yeah. I mean, you can go two hours on the zip line. Across the water, across the wild animals. Really cool. One way? Yes, one way. <laughs> <laughs> Mikey Ma took double in two runs back in the first inning. That's the good news. And he was picked off. That'll stay in the park. Elliot Johnson. Two down. I am such, as I said, a zoo guy. I love watching Jack Hanna on with Letterman because I don't know who's more excited to be there, <laughs> Letterman or Jack Hanna. But, you know, they certainly, and his depth of knowledge about animals, I, I we ran out of time, but I'd love to know, you know, where does he go to learn about these species? You talk about an animal that lives the talk at elevation, yeah, above where the pandas live. I mean, that's phenomenal. I may have a picture that I'll show you of this talking. It looks like a bare body with a sheep's head. Wow. It's one of the most unique animals, and they have the largest herd anywhere. Wilson Bediment can't dig in. Hit a fly ball to left back in the first inning. But you know, and it's interesting because you think of Columbus when you think of minor league baseball because of the Clippers. They've been so successful here for so long. They've had minor league baseball here since middle of the 19th century, almost yeah. when baseball was invented. But you forget they've got this tremendous zoo up here. Well, I like when he said this town has been so good to he yes. and his family, even yes. though he's from Tennessee. And so this is a way that he can give back. That is, I'll tell you what surprised me, 176 million people visit zoos a year. That's amazing. Called strike three, catches Betamit. Another good inning for Davies. And we'll go to the bottom of the third. Clippers and Bulls tied up to a piece in the minor league baseball game of the week here on the CBS Sports Network. Back in Columbus, Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn, we're all tied up. We talked about Bull Durham, the movie, earlier. Lauren had a chance to talk to some of the players about their favorite scenes. Well, you can't think about the Durham Bulls without thinking about the movie Bull Durham. We thought it would be interesting to speak with some of the Bulls players here and see what their favorite lines and scenes are from the movie. I'm alongside Durham center fielder Mikey Ma took. What's your favorite line? There's a lot to choose from. Uh, there's too many to choose from, actually. I can't pick one. Um, probably uh, the rain delay line. You know, it's, you know, they say they need a rain delay, and they flood the field, so that's probably my favorite part. If you play minor league baseball, you're always kind of wishing for a rain out at some point during the year. So um, it's got to be the fight on the bus uh, because that actually happens here in minor league baseball uh, a lot more than you think. So it's a harsh reality of the game we play in. Yeah, I'd have to say when uh, Crash Davis gave uh, Nuke the ball and uh, told him to hit him right in the head when they were outside the bar and he missed and it went right through the glass window. So that. That had to be my favorite part of the movie. That is my favorite scene as well. <laughs> it really is. Hey, I'm impressed, guys, but oh, a little yeah, bit about the movie. It. But my favorite line is when Crash walks in and they say, Who are you? And he says, I'm the player to be named later. Because <laughs> you never know. Who Been that's there. Be. Been there. Yeah, yeah, I know you have, but uh, it was a big league player to be named later. <laughs> Oh, there's so many good scenes in that movie. Yeah, they really it, were. You know, it makes you want to go back and get it and watch it again. Giovanni Urshela bounced to short off of this young man, Danny Romero. This has settled into something of a pitcher's duel. At least it appears to be that way after some fireworks to open the game. Well, if their games hold true to form, we've seen about all the scoring we're going to see, except somebody will have to win it, I assume. You know what's great too is that you know a couple of old guys like you and me we know that movie inside out well Lauren knows it, and these players know it too. Yeah that's true. But if you're a minor league player if you're a baseball player of any kind you had to have watched that one two or three times. Well especially when you came up to the minor leagues because you did a lot of bus rides and you get a chance to pick some of the movies that you get to watch so I would say that that happens to be one of the favorite that they will see on the buses. Of course once you get to triple A you're going to be flying. 
Your Shayla goes the other way and drives Jerry Sands back back. Nice catch. Nice grab by Sands. He had it measured all the way. You could see him. He knew when he got to the warning track that he only had a couple of feet. Jumps up, makes a nice catch and right. So now four straight retired by Romero. Take another look at Sands. As you said, he knew exactly where he was. Yep. And you, there's a little dip that goes back there where it moves on out to right center field. One of the things you do as a player when you get to the ballpark is you go out and you check out the dimensions of the field, check out how the ball comes off the wall, which way the wind is blowing. Jesus Aguilar drew a walk his last time up. Stranded back in the first inning. There you see seven bombs already this year. And he's driven in 19. Romero gets him to chase. I remember reading about Paul Blair, the great center fielder for the Orioles, back with those great Frank and Brooks Robinson. He's a ball tremendous clubs. ball player. He had so much speed, so he played a shallow center. That's a souvenir. Blair, like you said, when he got to the ballpark for the first time on the road, he would plan himself where he knew he was going to be and then run full speed to the ball, counting his steps. Smart. That's why I won 10 gold gloves. That's right. Yeah, we lost him way too soon. Yeah. He was a fine fellow, and he got to know him over the years doing some alumni work. Loved to play golf, loved to bowl, loved to be around people. And boy, could he play that center field. Wore the Reds uniform at one point in time. Had his best years, though, as I said, with the Orioles. Man, how good were they defensively, too? People, I mean, they had great pitching, and then they had outstanding defense back in those years and that was again a team that was built Frank Robinson notwithstanding through the minors. Yeah. Yeah and I think you see it a lot of teams going back to that now free agency kind of messed it up a little bit but a lot of teams trying to develop their own right now. Well, they're trying to be smarter about it. You can always make the big sign the signing but you've got to for financial sake if nothing else make your minor leagues work. Here's a good look at the Clippers bench. Aguilar 6'3", 250. He's a load and he can play this game. Out of Venezuela. On a three game hitless streak though he liked to reverse that he came off a four game hitting streak. Went cold. Well, not this time. Boy, you went from 96 on the pitch before that to 84. And that makes it really tough because it's hard to sit on an off speed pitch when you got that kind of gas. And it's hard to adjust to a pitch that's off speed that much when fourth, you're looking for 96. Fourth strikeout for Romero. He also struck out this young man, David Cooper, back in the first inning. Drop down to 82 on that breaking ball. We've already seen a pick off tonight, an outstanding double play. And as Doug mentioned, more runs or as many runs scored already as these two teams averaged in their four game series. Earlier this season. Well, both of them right there in the hunt, too, in their respective divisions. One a half a game out, being uh, the Durham Bulls, just a half a game, and three and a half back is Columbus. So early in the year, they're right where they're supposed to be. High and deep, Sands looking up. Now gives way to Matuk. Just enough ballpark for that fly ball by David Cooper. We'll go to the fourth, tied at two in Columbus. Minor league game of the week on the CBS Sports Network. I don't have an allergy attack while I'm here. Back in Columbus, Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn, and we're joined now in the booth by Tim Belcher, longtime 
big leaguer and now the assistant to the general manager here in Columbus. First of all, thanks for joining us in what is an open air press box in a tremendous ballpark. It's got to be great coming to work every day. Yeah, isn't this a great ballpark? Great city. Um, and probably better correct you. I'm sorry to do that, but I'm not Ken's assistant, although he would probably love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a special assistant to baseball operations for the Indians. So, ah, gotcha. So there are a AAA affiliate, and I, you know, hear a lot, so I see Ken a lot. I don't work for him, though. Which means he gets to play in his own hours, show up at the ballpark when he wants to, go play golf, then come over. Shh, don't it, tell anybody. But well, no. that's a lot better, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You know, Timmy's from Ohio, and he, yeah. and he grew up being a big Reds he fan. Sure I did. know this for a fact. But when he broke into the big leagues, I think it was like 88, 87, like. 87, then 88. You go on and become uh, best pitcher in the league, rookie pitcher of the league, and they win the World Series in 88. So Dick has always wanted to meet a real big leaguer. So I'm glad you're up here. <laughs> <laughs> you're a real big leaguer in my mind. Anybody who's on those big red machine teams is a big, big leaguer to me. And uh, boy, I sure had a lot of fun watching you and, and the rest of that club. That was. Uh, that was amazing. You know, it, with your job right now, you get a chance to go see a lot of these good young players. And uh, in your opinion, we, we sit up here and we don't try to second guess, but good night, these guys are monsters. They really are. I mean, it, it's that way in, in every in every sport, you know, in every walk of life. Everybody's bigger, stronger, faster, and baseball's no different. Are they, do they play the game better? Not always, not yeah. necessarily, but I don't think they play as much as you did or I did as a kid. You know, they're playing Xbox and I agree. Uh, watching 700 channels on TV. <laughs> Jerry Sands goes the other way. They had shifted to the left, and he goes into the gap. And Sands will chug into second with a stand-up double. It's doubles night, as I mentioned earlier, here at the ballpark. These are two teams that don't score a lot of runs against each other, Tim, but they're Getting it done offensively tonight, at least early. They really are, yeah. Kyle uh, Kyle Davies is coming off a shoulder injury, and he, he just really hasn't gotten his fastball back yet. And, you know, it was it was pretty loud. My seats in the scouting section right down there is close enough to home plate. It it was loud. I was getting flashbacks <laughs> from when I was pitching uh, way back when. But uh, he, he kind of righted the ship there in the second and third inning. Uh, so hopefully he can. Uh, Strand this leadoff double. Doug was teasing you about making your own hours, but but what exactly is it that you do? What are your responsibilities? A little bit of everything. Um, uh, a lot of what I do is what I'm doing today, watching our AAA club. I live about 40 miles north of Columbus, so I can commute here and I can commute to Akron, our AA Eastern League club. Uh, next week I'm going to see our Carolina League club. I make one trip down there a year. Um, well, I tell you something that you did. And, and I, I looked it up, and I, it, it's hard to believe because you don't see it anymore. In one year, he threw 10 complete games, had eight shutouts. Wow. I mean, now guys are on pitch counts. What's the most pitches you ever threw in a game? Ooh. <laughs> I, I actually threw over 150 in A ball one year. <laughs> that, they were keeping track then, and that did get the manager in a little bit of hot water. But, yeah, routinely in the big leagues, in my big league career, I was between 100, 135 pitches most starts. Yeah, but if you had a lead and it was seventh and eighth inning, they're going to have to come out there with a tractor to pull you out the mound. Am I correct or not? Yeah, a big tractor, 100-plus horse. There you go. Yeah. I see guys today, I mean, there's so many specialists in the game today, but... Man, back when you were pitching and, and the, in those days, guys were not going to come out. If you had a chance to get a W in a complete game, you're going to stay. You don't want somebody to screw it up for you. No question about it, and particularly in the American League. I spent the second half of my career in the American League, the first half in the National League. But, uh, you know, you can struggle early like Kyle Davies did in this game, for instance, and hang around, hang around, hang around, and, and you know, pick up that 8-6 to six win. Yeah. You know? Uh, doesn't always have to be two to one. Just just outscore the other guy. Davies in a bit of trouble here now with a runner at third and nobody out. I know guys from the Reds used to talk about how many wins they may have had had Sparky not yanked them in the seventh or the eighth because they knew the team was going to come back and score runs later. Yeah. Yeah. Billingham still blames him because he didn't win 20. Should get the runner home. They'll know with an RBI. And that snaps the tie. Three two bulls here in the fourth inning. We're talking with Tim Belcher, who's now part of the Indians front office. And as he mentioned, sort of midway between Columbus or and now right in the middle, Columbus, Akron, Cleveland. We've noticed, Doug and I have, and it doesn't take any genius to see that 
a lot of teams now are trying to see to it that one or two of their minor league teams are closer to the big park which a big team which has got to make it easier on you guys. Well it, it does and in, in a case like yesterday is a perfect example uh, when you have your triple A club that's just an hour and a half two hours down the road and you have a game where your starter gets knocked out in the second inning and you <laughs> use the entire bullpen you got to make a, a late night um, roster move. Uh, it's a lot easier to do yeah. <laughs> when your team is two hours down the road it's true. than it would be if they were uh, two states away, for instance. Hey, how do you go into Cincinnati and win 15 ball games and they trade you? <laughs> Good question. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I was I was going to be a free agent. I wasn't under a long term contract in 93 when they got to the trade deadline. We weren't really in the hunt and uh, Lou was gone at that point. Uh, Doggy had started the yeah. 93 season as a manager Tony a short Perez. stint and then they brought Davey Johnson in and I just think uh, Jim Bowden was uh, looking to uh, make sure he got something for me instead of me walking at the end of the year as a free agent. So made the trade with the White Sox. Got to play in the, in the postseason again with there the White Sox. Go, right. the year, We've seen so many of these young players who have been up and down and moved around of course for much of their minor league careers. What is it like and of course that happened with Doug with you know several uh, big league teams but to, to have to deal as a ball player with that aspect of the game where you're you're going to be on the move it's almost accepted I know but I'm sure that you move probably oh. a nice play wow. by Ramirez but he beats it out but you know, I know that's part of it but how difficult is that to make that adjustment as a young player for these guys and for you guys well it really is I mean it's it's uh but it after a while and Doug can can relate to this you know you just get used to it I mean it's 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 part of your life you know I my wife and I sat down at one point I Played four years in the minor leagues, and uh, you know the first few years or first ten years of my career, I was with three different clubs or whatever, and sat down one day and figured out how many different apartments you know <laughs> we were in over the years. You know all the minor league clubs and moving during the minor league season, spring mm. training, then instructional league, and so forth. Wow! Great jump, doesn't even draw a throw, and the steal for Justin Christian. Now runner in scoring position again. For Durham. Left handed hitter to plate doesn't hurt. Well, he just going on first movement. It looked like he'd read him, and Davey didn't quite take a good look at him. Great pickoff move a few minutes ago. Is that something they worked on today when you got here? No, <laughs> no, it wasn't. But, you know, he's, he's a wily veteran. I mean, he's got considerable big league time, uh, Kyle Davies, and, uh, you know, he, he picked a good spot to, to do a spin move back to second base there. And, and fortunately, Jose was was on top of it and ran a daylight play, as I'm yep. sure you're familiar with. Yep. He called it. Well, I, you know, there were certain guys you just wouldn't put that on with them. I mean, guys, I play. I would not put that on with Joaquin Andujar. He might throw it over the center fielder's head. He either throw that <laughs> or he throw a sinker at your foot. I was actually in camp one year with uh, with Oakland, 84 or 85, in big league camp for for a few weeks, and Joaquin was there. You were traded for one of my buddies, or in part of a trade with one of my buddies, Mr. Rick Honeycutt. Yep. Yeah, I was traded uh, one for one, me for Rick, uh, 1987. He came. Uh, from the Dodgers to Oakland. I was in AAA with Oakland yep. and went to the Dodgers. That was a trade that really worked out well for both teams. Yeah, it was. We pitched against each other in the World Series how the about very that? next year. So, uh, you and I were talking, Tim, before the game about this ballpark and about how the ballparks have changed since both of you guys came up through the minors because America has embraced minor league baseball. Isn't this beautiful? It's yeah. a great setting. and Terrific stop by Rollinger. I tell you, we've seen two great defensive plays, but because of the speed of the runners, yeah. no chance to get them. Pair of infield singles, runners at the corners now. So a sack fly brings in a run. That's outstanding, and the fact and that he could get up. Yeah. Wow. Ryan's a good all-around player. He can play anywhere in the infield, and he's got some big league time as well. Um, you know, he's a great, uh, great addition to our AAA club here. I think everything about this has been impressive since we walked in the door. I mean, just you feel like you're at a ballpark. I mean, you don't feel like that I'm at a a circus or something. It's you feel like, all right, if they do anything other than baseball around here, they've really messed up. Running grab by Moncrief. Wow. But a 4-2 game could have been a lot worse. So a pair of sack flies. 
for the Bulls and the lead is back up to two four to two the Bulls of Durham leading Columbus. All right Timmy evaluate what's going on with Kyle with the pitches. I'm what I've been seeing is everything he's thrown breaking ball has been hit hard it's been belt higher. Yeah and, he, and like I mentioned earlier Kyle just doesn't have enough fastball to to protect himself you know and get it by somebody you know, get a swing and a miss occasionally so. Uh, if he's not throwing all of his secondary pitches over for strikes and at the bottom of the zone for yep. strikes, you know, hitters are just going to spit on that stuff and, and wait for the fastball, and that's what they're doing. Is well, that why he is bounced back and forth? Yeah, yeah. He's coming off of a serious shoulder injury, and uh, he just hadn't regained his uh, his velocity yet. You know, and he's had some considerable considerable success in the big leagues. So, you know, he's a crafty guy. He's not overpowering. He never has been, but uh, he knows how to pitch and and. Uh, you know knows how to control damage he just needs a little bit more fastball to come back. Well we were told he was somewhere between 87 and 91. What was he before the injury. You know I don't really recall what he topped out at but it wasn't overpowering it wasn't like mid 90s stuff yeah. but it was probably consistently low 90s but yeah he's uh, he's definitely a little short of that. Uh, Hock Julie standing in for Durham as Doug mentioned earlier Korean born. Obviously we've seen players from South America for many many years but now we saw a player earlier this year born in Italy player from Korea. I mean you guys will go anywhere there's talent now won't you. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there's a wealth of talent around the world. Yeah. Are you amazed at the number of guys that are throwing ninety five plus. Yeah I am. I, I am mean, too. When you when you watch a, from triple A on up and especially in the big leagues. Uh, you watch a game and everybody that comes out of the bullpen if somebody comes out of your bullpen throwing less than 95 you're like what's wrong with these guys. You know? <laughs> what's wrong with this team. Hey, we watched a college team that did the same thing Vanderbilt that had six oh, guys man. so 95 plus. Elliot Johnson makes the grab Tim thank you so much great visiting with you. Thank you. Tim Thanks Belcher. For Doug, great to see you buddy. OK. And we'll have more from Columbus. It's a 4 2 Durham lead minor league game of the week on CBS Sports Network. Back in Columbus 4 to Durham uh, Lauren earlier had her Fenway experience now she's ready for her Wrigley Field experience here Absolute. at Huntington Park. What's going on. Absolutely Dick well from Boston to Chicago and these seats cost a little bit more than the free ones outside of the ballpark just seven bucks to access these Wrigley like um, bleachers right here. We're having a blast up here. Not only a great vantage point of the game, but a amazing view of the sunset. If you guys can only see this, it is breathtaking. I'm alongside some Clippers fans here. Rachel, this is a regular occurrence for you, isn't it? Right. I probably come to at least three games per week when the Clippers are home. It's I live in the arena district five minutes away and it's just something so fun to do on a nice night like this. This is an absolutely perfect night and you can get up to these seats with any ticket that you purchase. Is that correct. That is correct. We got the seven dollar tickets tonight the standing room tickets so we can come up to these seats eat some roosters wings and hang out with friends. It's a perfect night. And why did you choose coming up here. You could have roved around gone in any other place in the ballpark. Why these bleachers some of those seats down there they're padded. You're aware of that right. Yeah we are aware of that but we've got the sunset to look up up here. Um, we've got a view of the entire ballpark and we've got some good food up here so it's perfect. I don't think it gets much better than that guys a good view a little bit of baseball and good food. I don't think it gets much better. I might stay up here. And then you throw in the sunset and boy what a perfect venue and I hope you can see that sign over Lauren's shoulder 480 if you can only hit it off that wall you have really hit a shot but this is just a part of the great personality of this ballpark. I don't think she's going to leave. I think she's locked in. I don't blame her. Now Carlos Moncrief he went yard his last time up a two run shot in the second inning and our thanks again to Tim Belcher for joining us. And Right next door is a party pavilion. Here's another great way to watch this ball game. It's just to the right of where Lauren was seated and again just a tremendous venue here at Huntington Park in Columbus. We're going to talk to the man who was instrumental in plotting and planning this facility a little bit later on in the telecast. But this was no accident. And right underneath it. The Hall of Fame bar 220 feet long and a great way to sit and enjoy a game and talk baseball and 
lived through some of the great moments in Columbus Clipper history. They've had some great teams here. They've won minor league championships. They won the Governor's Cup back to back. Again, part of the Indians organization. For many years, a Triple A team for the Yankees. Also affiliated at one point with the Pirates and with the Nationals. Lee with an easier play, but pulls Belnome off the bag. Now it goes a throwing error. Earlier, Lee made a gorgeous play with the sun blinding him. Yeah, that time he really didn't get his feet in a good position. Caught the ball back between his legs. Kind of bobbled it a little bit and sort of nonchalant at the first. The ball sailed on him, and when it did, good hustle by Moncrief running that out all the way. Big man was getting down the line. First error of the ball game tonight. And a 4-2 Durham lead. Now Ryan Rollinger doubled his last time up down the right field line. Speaking of some of the alumni that have come through here, you know Jack Buck actually came through Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Back in the 50s. Great broadcaster with one of my favorite all times with your St. Louis Cardinals. Pat Hughes, the current voice, radio voice of the Cubs. Worked here as well. So did the current Cleveland Indians radio voice, Tom Hamilton. Ballpark completed in 09. April of 09. They broke ground August of 2007. The old park a couple of miles away in more of an industrial area. This one, as you can tell, right in the middle of downtown Columbus. Replaced the former home of the Clippers, Cooper Stadium. And as Lauren mentioned early in our telecast, this was named Ballpark of the Year in 2012. Beating out the two ballparks that have been renovated and reopened in New York Yankee Stadium and City Field. They did a lot of work on City Field too. They had the fences really deep and there were no home runs being had hit there. So they brought the fences in a little bit. Try to make it a little more fan friendly. Well, Doug mentioned this is a spacious ballpark but. We saw earlier. They've got the bats to get out of here or at least rattle the fences. Oh yeah. And it carries good the way the wind's blowing too. It has died down a little bit but it's still blowing out. They actually squeezed 12,500 into this ballpark. In 2010 when the Pawtucket Red Sox were in town. 3 2 pitch. They keep fouling it back over our heads. I'm sitting next to a gold glover and they won't challenge you. What, what's up with that? Thank you. <laughs> that is fine with me. You know we take a good look at that batter's eye which is so important in ballparks these days. And we were told maybe we'll hear more from Ken when he gets here. How they can electronically lower that yeah. so people from the outside can look into the ballpark. On, on Brilliant days, idea. Yeah. Brilliant idea. Not during a game, of course, but they like to lower that. They like to collapse it when the team is not playing to give folks here in Columbus a good look at the inside, plant the seed in their head. Hey, maybe I could go to the ball game. Mm. Romero just missing away. Now with a one out, two on. Big opportunity here for Columbus. George Kataris attended Connor State Junior College taken by the Padres in the 20th round in 2002. We were talking with the mound visit talking earlier about why this is called Huntington Park. Lauren has more on that, Lauren. Well, guys, it's a really interesting story. I was told that the original roster 
for the Columbus Clippers at the time known as the Columbus Capitals in 1867. A man by the name of P.W. Huntington was on that roster. Well, after the first year, he didn't quite cut it, and he was released from the team and he was a bank teller as his everyday job as you guys well know a lot of those ball players weren't able to make a living in just playing baseball well after he was cut he decided to start his own bank by the name of Huntington Bank and if you look at the sign there I think it went pretty well for Mr. P.W. Yeah. Huntington. I think he landed on yeah. his feet yeah this has got to be the only ballpark in America maybe the world named after a former player who was cut by the team that's right I'm still waiting for Flynn Bank to open up. Streets around the ballpark are named for former players. Got a little action going on in the Durham bullpen. Looks like Jake Thompson down there warming up. 6'2", 225 pound right hander. And again, another big one. <laughs> another big one. Uh, you know. Boy, just walking down during batting practice and seeing these kids as they're around the cage how strong they are good look at Thompson getting loose just in case the terrace has been in the, in the majors rather and September 3rd of 2011 hit for the cycle and he was a member of the Milwaukee Brewers did that against the Houston Astros and believe it or not the third Brewers catcher ever to do that with Chad Moeller and Charlie Moore. But they got him looking there. Two out. Just painted the corner on him that time. 95 mile an hour fastball. So pretty much what Neil was saying before the game. Later in the game, he's going to be more consistent in the 94 to 96 range, and we're seeing that right now. Top of the order, Jose Ramirez doubled back in the first inning. And a fly ball in the second. Two runs in the first for Durham. The Clippers answered with two in the second. Two more for Durham in the fourth inning, but Columbus threatening again. Hey, we've had a couple of great guests. I mean, Jack Hannon and Tim Belcher was an excellent pitcher. Absolutely. Randy Mobley with the International League will chat with Lauren very shortly. We talk about a league that expanded as yeah. minor league baseball sort of reshuffled its deck. Deep but Christian's got to play on it. And Durham works out of the jam. The Clippers strand two. And we'll go to the fifth. Durham leads it 4 2 here at Huntington Park. It's the minor league game of the week. 4-2 lead for Durham here in Columbus. Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn, and Lauren Gardner, who's got Randy Mobley, the president of the International League. Well, you know, guys, I've been all over this ballpark, and I found a very special guest. Randy, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Triple A baseball has become such a big thing in these communities. Talk about how you have seen this minor league baseball evolve. Well, minor league baseball in general, uh, as I'm sure you've talked about, has just been going gangbusters. And here in the central Ohio area, uh, Columbus has a long, long history of, of minor league baseball. Uh, but of late, moving into this new ballpark here six years ago, uh, they just really breathed new life into the entire operation, the entire franchise. So uh, the move downtown, as I know you've seen in some of your other telecasts around uh, baseball the last few weeks, it's no different here. Downtown is the place to be. Not only are they providing phenomenal entertainment here downtown, the Columbus Clippers, let's talk about the impact they're having on these communities. Well, it's just fabulous. Uh, you know, when we go around to these cities and you're in that process of trying to get new ballparks built, uh, you're, they're actually talking about all of the economic development that goes along with those, and we've seen it happen time and time again. And this ballpark being a part of a larger downtown development, redevelopment, uh, has certainly not been any exception to that at all. 
And the product on the field isn't too shabby either. We've seen some actual good players come up and down uh, on rehab assignments. But talk about some of the top prospects in this league currently. Well, there's uh, there, there's there's name after name. You know, they've got uh, the Columbus first baseman Jesus Aguilar, who's just recently back down here with this with this ball club. You know, the, the big player in Indianapolis that you had on the air from uh, Charlotte a couple of weeks ago, Polanco, you know, is probably going to be in Pittsburgh before long. So we could go through team by team. And uh, it, you're right, it's, uh, it's top quality baseball. I have been bouncing around this ballpark, Randy, throughout the entire evening. And I can tell you, there are not enough innings really to go and highlight all these great spots. Let's talk about the fan experience. Well that's one of the things about these new ballparks is you're trying to create as many different nuances in them as you can. You know you want those fans to have to come four or five six times before they really have experienced the entire ballpark. And in this one with the bleachers up top and the uh, the pavilion out in right field the double deck area and then just all the other areas that fans can visit and enjoy the game. It takes them a while to explore, but now after six years, those who have been coming have, have found their favorite places. What's your favorite place? My favorite place on a night like this is about 10 rows behind the first base dugout. Sit there with a nice uh, diet soda and a hot dog and enjoy the game. I'll tell you the favorite place for uh, our broadcasters over there, Doug and Dick. I would say it's the outdoor broadcast booth right behind home plate. That's a very nice feature, guys. I'll bet you're enjoying that. We really are. Thank you, Randy, for joining us. And Lauren, thank you very much. And uh, they're just, as you said, so much to like about this ballpark. And as Lauren pointed out, unless we go extra, there's not enough time in the <laughs> evening to, to talk about all the great vantage points. Well, she's getting her steps in today. This is really nice. I am enjoying sitting out here. We have plenty of room. Uh, they thought of everything from a, usually they try to do it from a fan perspective and a player's perspective, but they have done it for the broadcasters, for the vendors, for everybody here. Well, you saw Lee and Nick's go down, and now Mikey Matuk stands in. I beg your pardon, that's Betterman. He's 0 for 2, a fly ball, a strikeout. So Davies roughed up in both the first and the fourth. Looking for his third one, two, three inning. I was reading something about Benjamin and the way that he said he had started saying his name now, which was from his native country, was Baitume. Baitume. I'm thinking, well, I've often thought about changing my name, but there's nothing where you can go with it. <laughs> Well, maybe you can pronounce the second N in Flynn. Oh. Because it's always been silent. And the sec that's exactly right. He is a good ball player, though. Absolutely. 6'2", 220, Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. And a switch hitter. And looking for his first base hit tonight. And Davies was on his way to the dugout. He thought that was strike three. But uh, instead, he issues his... Second walk of the night. This pitch is close. Watch your catcher. Yeah, it pitches down. The catcher does a good job of framing it to try to make it look like a strike. But his misses now are a little bit better than they were early in the game. And to the credit of the Durham Bulls, they haven't missed many pitches when they've got a chance to hit them. Jerry Sands, as Doug mentioned, had a terrific round of batting practice earlier today. And it's two for two tonight with a single and a double scored a run back in the fourth inning. Sands took a little while to get untracked in the minors. But as we mentioned back in 2010, which was his third year in minor league baseball just caught fire in the Midwest League was the player of the game in the All-Star game and directly after that is we're going to get a mound visit was promoted to the Chattanooga lookout to the Southern League and eventually became the Dodgers minor league player of the year not all the way up to Albuquerque in 2011 the isotopes 
Called up to the Dodgers. First at bat, he doubled. His first homer shortly thereafter up Mark Burley. Yeah, got a lefty warming up now. They're trying to get him ready real quick. You can see sort of speeding up. Nick Haggard and getting ready to come in just in case right now. This will be the 99th pitch for Davies. You know, and you listen to Belcher talk. He's normally through for a nine inning game, somewhere between 100, 115. We're yep. looking at 99 here and just in the fifth inning. He has thrown a lot. That's because the Bulls have hit him hard at times. In the gap. He got jammed on that one. Good Covering take charge. A lot of ground, Elliot Johnson. So the Bulls strand one, and it remains a two run game to the bottom of the fifth. Durham four, Columbus two, back with more. CBS Sports Network. Brandon Gomes, the new pitcher for Durham, 5'11", 195, the right-hander. And he checks in for Romero. Left with a 4-2 lead. Gomes is from Fall River, Massachusetts. Played his college ball at Tulane, making his 21st appearance. 4.91 ERA, 22 innings. News from around minor league baseball. What about Mike Hester? 400 minor league homers. We talked about Bull Durham and Crash Davis and his storyline. He was pursuing the record for minor league homers. How about Mike Hessman? Now has 255 in the International League alone. How you hit that many home runs and you're not in the big leagues? Well, he's been up with uh, five for five partial seasons with Atlanta, Detroit, the Mets. He's got 14 big league home runs. In the IL alone, he is three behind the all-time leader, Ali Carnegie. So that's something he can aim for. And you always talk about chasing that dream. That's well, it. Mike Hessman's proven he's got ballpark power. <laughs> has to find the right spot with a big league team. It's Elliot Johnson, who closed out the inning with a running grab, leads off, looking for his first hit, 0 for 2 today. We talked about all these kids that can throw pretty hard. First pitch we see from Brandon Gomes is at 92 miles an hour so you know they go from 95 back to 92 from the right side there's one at 93 good arms on these young kids what they have to do now is learn to pitch and not just throw and that's what they'll learn from guys like Arnold and Neil Allen and all the pitching coaches around the league. Gomes working out of the stretch with the bases empty and he fooled Johnson. Take a look at another headline. We saw uh, Polanco, as we mentioned, and uh, Randy Moby mentioned. Greg Polanco, Pirates prospect, leads AAA in batting average, on base percentage, slugging, hits, total bases, runs, RBIs. Had a big week. So did Joey Gallo, a Rangers prospect. He leads all minor leaguers with 18 home runs. He led the minors last year with 40. So those are your respective minor league players of the week. And again, what do you do with them if there's no room to bring them up? There's a lot of debate in Pittsburgh about bringing up Polanco. Johnson Hit charges good. one in the left, but Christian with a little more real estate. Maybe just off the end just a little bit. How about triple plays on Monday? Two triple plays on the same night, same game. The Burlington Bees, the Pawtucket Red Sox. It went to extras. Burlington won it. Two triple plays. What if you're in the ballpark for that one? You'll never forget that. Never night. forget it. Yeah, just seeing one is a thrill. Giovanni Yersela, 0 for 2, the ground ball, fly ball. What? And a lucky souvenir for a lucky fan. If they're not knocked out. It's exactly right. All the fans around him are lucky. And folks, we were in Fresno last week. And we saw that happen three times. And in Fresno, it was 100 degrees. So you'd think their hands were a little slippery. I don't know what happened there, but see if they let him keep it. Well, they had an usher come down to him. He's holding on to it for dear life. Nobody spilled the beer either. One more headline for you. Did you see this video? I did not. Well, 
the cat that was the hero. We'll tell you why I was a hero in a minute. Threw I saw the, the, what the cat did. He threw out the first pitch. Okay, well, he threw out the first pitch for the Bakersfield Blaze. Easy play. Nice play. Got off the mound really, really well that time. That, of course, was the cat that saved the little boy from the attacking dog. And so he threw out the first pitch last night. Of course, he had help from his owner. The, the pitch is the cat's name was Tara. Might be a female cat, but that's got to be a first. But there again, something you see only in minor league baseball. And by the way, the Bakersfield Blaze pitching coach is your old friend Tom Browning. That's true. That's exactly right. He said, he said, I'm not uh, looking forward to meeting the cat. I'm looking forward to meeting the little boy. <laughs> MILB.com, your home to all the latest news, stats, schedules from around the minors. Check it out today, MILB.com, and stay up to date on all the action. It's going to be hard to top those headlines next week, especially two triple plays and a hero cat. You can't compete with animals. Jack Hanna will tell you that. Well, good location we there. I forgot to ask Jack Hanna about the hero cat. That would have been a perfect question. I blame myself. Okay, I will too. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Aguilar, a tremendous prospect we heard about earlier. We've seen him tonight. A walk, a strikeout. Well, we got him play here him. for Bell Nome. And a good inning for Gomes. His first on the bump for Durham. We'll go to the top of the sixth. 4 2 Bulls, a minor league game of the week. Bulls with a 4-2 lead over the Clippers here in Columbus. From hoops to hockey, the diamond to the draft. Morning's most outrageous team has you covered. Don't miss Boomer and Carton weekday morning starting at 6 on CBS Sports Network, the 24-hour home of CBS Sports. Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn, Lauren Gardner having a great time at Huntington Park in Columbus. Where the Bulls will try to extend their lead over the homestanding Clippers who have drawn another terrific crowd here to this beautiful ballpark on a gorgeous night for baseball. New pitcher into the game Nick Hagedon's in big six foot five left hander. We've okay. seen more tall pitchers this year. Yeah, we were talking the other day they say it's fastballs around ninety four. Yow. Six five two thirty he goes. And talk a little bit if you will about that. Delivery that straight over the top motion from that 6 5 frame on a mound. Well, his first pitch 94 miles an hour, yeah. we see, so uh, right on cue. You get a 6 5 guy like this, you find out if he's going to hide the ball, kind of drops it back behind him. Native of Sandpoint, Idaho, pitched his college baseball at the University of Washington. He's had a couple of stints in the majors. Going up to try to help the Indians on two or three occasions. They brought him over from the Red Sox in a multiplayer deal. Sox took him with their first pick in 2007. And I'll pack 10 player for the Huskies. Blew it right by him. That was 96. That'll work. And you got a lefty throwing that hard. And we haven't seen any of his breaking pitches or any off speed yet. Of course, he's throwing 96 from the left side. Don't always have to. So now Justin Christian singled, stole a base, scored a run back in the fourth inning, struck out in the first. And has been a busy man in the outfield tonight for Durham. Bulls jumped out to the quick 2 nothing lead in the first. Clippers got him back in the second. Bulls with two more in the fourth. Clippers have had opportunities putting runners on base. Durham getting just enough pitching. Now Columbus into its bullpen as Kyle Davies left the ball game and a drive. Matt Carson tracking it. So is Johnson. Carson, two out.
Balls have a funny sound, Dick. And we'd think they'd be carrying a little more with that win, so I just don't think everybody's squaring it up as well as they possibly can. That one looked like he was off the end of the bat, and he still drove it. Yeah, and you can see with, with the flags blowing like they are, ball gets up high above the stadium. It's going to move out there a little bit. Bondo with a good one. Two for two. Infield single is last time up. Drove it to the right of Ryan Rollinger at second base. He made a terrific stop, but out of that left handed box, Fontenot with all kinds of speed just beat it out. Really yanked the string on him that time. Boy, there's a, this is refreshing to see 5'9, 165 pounder <laughs> who's, but he has spent, as you said, time in the big leagues. Yeah. And it's shown tonight he's still swinging the bat pretty good. What you're saying is you can relate to yeah, him a little easier than the 6'5 guy on the mound? Well, exactly. Oh, that caught a lot of somebody, catcher or umpire. And they both wear a lot of padding, one more than the other. I know a first round pick of the Orioles signed for one point three million traded to the Cubs in 05 part of a deal that involved Mr. Sammy Sosa. Wow. And he went down on strikes the second strikeout of the inning. We'll go to the bottom of the six. It's still 4 2 Durham here in Columbus. Minor League Baseball game of the week on the CBS Sports Network. Back in Columbus, Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn, and Lauren Gardner. Lauren, we were talking about some of the great alumni of the Columbus Clippers, both for the Yankees and the Indians. Yeah, absolutely, Dick. And I was able to speak with Jason Kipnis, who is the Indians all-star second baseman. He's down here on a rehab assignment. He was actually supposed to come here tomorrow, but he decided to arrive a little bit earlier. The Indians are on the road, and he decided why not buy the spread for all of his fellow teammates here in Columbus, as you know all too well, Doug. But, uh, you know, he was able to take a little bit of BP today. I spoke with him. He says that Oblique is feeling a lot better. He even joked. He said, well, I'm at the point where I'm not crying when I cough anymore, if that's any indication as to where I'm at right now in my rehab process. He will be playing about five innings tomorrow. He'll play Saturday, take Sunday off, and then Monday will be de to be determined as to how he is feeling, guys. I'm glad to hear he's doing better. Doug and I were fortunate enough to see the early stages of Jason's college career at Kentucky and was a very good player. In fact, Grand Slam in his first at bat and then transferred to Arizona State, became an All American. Yep. Now, one of the better second basemen in the American League for the Cleveland Indians. So tell him we said hello. Yeah, that's right. Good job, Lauren. Watch him taking ground balls today. If he's got a bad oblique, it doesn't show. So I saw him uh, taking some throws, throwing sidearm, moving pretty fluid. Swinging the bat, of course, is going to be the big issue, but if he's going to try five tomorrow and seven the next day, then he's feeling a lot, lot better. David Cooper, 0 for 2 on the night. Native of Stockton, California. First round pick of the Blue Jays. I mentioned earlier. Played in the College World Series with Cal State Fullerton. And in that event, he recorded seven consecutive hits. Wow. And tied Terry Francona for second on that list. Dave Maganin, as you might expect, is one of the guys who shares the record eight straight hits. And the other, Mr. Barry Bonds. All lefties. The 1984 College World Series. I was actually at that event in 84. And the Golden Spikes winner that year was Oda B. McDowell, who went on to play for the, <laughs> for the Texas Rangers from Arizona State. And everybody was talking about him, the Golden Spikes winner. There he is. And he said, you know, that left fielder, that Bonds kid, he's pretty good, too. <laughs> Man, that's a pretty good year. And a leadoff walk now and an opportunity for Columbus again. Well, we're seeing Gomes with a very good arm, and he's not missing by a lot, but his pitch is just off the plate, and a good job right now by the Columbus hitters, especially by Cooper. 
of being very disciplined at the plate. Well, Romero gave up just the three hits, a couple of runs. They were both earned. And was sharp early, which as Doug mentioned, had been his problem. But then they reached him in the second inning for a couple of runs. He settled down. Durham turns to the bullpen. Now Matt Carson will try to at least move the runner. He walked and scored a run back in the second. And a froze him with a breaking ball there. Boy, sometimes when you're missing with one of your pitches, it's always good to be able to come back, try something different. Seen so many pitchers that they miss with a fastball and they just keep throwing it, keep throwing it. Come back with something a little different. He did that time with a slider. Carson is driven in 17, five homers, and looks at the fastball low and away. Boy, he's got a good arm. He's got a funky delivery, too, so he'd be nasty, especially on right handers. Carson with 36 base hits on the year. Again off speed and again gets the corner. Well right now that's definitely just showing him the fastball but not showing it to him over the plate and coming back with a breaking ball for a strike pitch. Gomes a second inning of relief. He measured the breaking ball that time but Matuk measures the fly ball. And there's one out and as you say you can almost tell by the sound that that'll stay in the ballpark. Yep it's it just sounds a little funny when they either got that ball a little bit in on the bat or a little out. Those balls that are hit on the screws like Moncrief's ball there's oh. not much doubt about those. And here he is again. Carlos Moncrief reached on an error his last time up on a routine ground ball to short. But in the second, crushed one. We'll take another look at it here in just a moment. Great pitch. Mm. And here's the big fly in the second inning that tied the game. I mean, there's high oh and good. Right fielder doesn't even know. Jerry Sands just said, all right. <laughs> okay. Do a good running fastball to him that last time that tied him up. Great job by Casale. Boy, just a great, great crowd tonight. They said it would probably be a sellout. It's close. And relaxing. There's so many places you can sit and relax and enjoy the game and see and get a different view of the game. Yeah, and the way the seats are all angled, there's yeah. no bad seats. No. Lawrence been to Practically every good spot in the ballpark, which will find something good for us. There's a wild pitch, second of the night here in this ballgame. First for Gomes. So now Cooper at second with one out. Runner in scoring position for Moncrief. And once again, though, Gomes trying to run it in on him. Yeah, he's uh, trying to get it up underneath his hands. He doesn't want him to extend because the last time he extended, he extended it out of the park. He sure did. I think the ball just stopped rolling. I saw some car stop over there and get it, I believe. <laughs> you know what? You can't see it. It's a foul ball, but just in the right field gap beyond that fence, somebody in a truck has stopped and decided to check out the ball game. There. Just to the left of our look at Sands. And you've got some folks in the knot holes taking in the game. For I free. love that idea. I love why not be able to yeah. come, especially young people, kids. I tell you, pounded him in, Absolutely. pounded him in, and then went away with a good moving fastball. Take a look at Ramirez and the night he had, or Romero, I should say. Yep. There's two of the strikeouts on breaking balls. Another one on a breaking ball. That was just some good gas, which got as high as 97 tonight. Good-looking lefty. 
And the one bad pitch to Moncrief, otherwise very sharp, I thought, in the four innings. Now I'd say Neil Allen would probably be pretty happy with that start. Ryan Rawlinger slid the hand up the barrel because Jason Nix is well deep at third base. In a situation like this, you don't want to leave it up to somebody else to drive him in. You really, if you're going to bunt, you're just thinking to yourself, you want to try to drive this runner home like that. And that indeed will get the runner home. They're going to hold Rollinger to just a single. But running on contact with two outs, David Cooper. And now, how big was the wild pitch? 4 3 game. We well, got a breaking ball, hits it off the end of the bat, but he stays in there, gets his foot down, does a nice job of just making contact. And the ball's hit perfectly just inside the line. Second hit of the night for Rawlinger. And a 4 3 Durham lead. Tying run at first. George Cotteris standing in. Cotteris at one point. Traded from San Diego to Boston and for a while there in 09 was Tim Wakefield's personal catcher. He yeah, could, he could corral the knuckleball. Boy, uh, how can you sleep the night before that game as a hitter? I don't see how well, or a catcher. Well, he had the knack for it. Jason Veritek caught everybody else. And now they call a balk on the quick move by Gomes the first. So a wild pitch and a balk in this inning. There's no argument. They Meyer not coming out of the dugout to try to argue this. We'll see if we can pick up what he did. Uh, he broke his knee. I guess that's what it was, and he calls it immediately. Once you break that knee, which he did before he threw over, that it is a ball. Break that knee. You've got to go to the plate. Cotter is trying to drive in that tying run. Both of his parents were born in Greece. He actually grew up in Toronto, but played for the Greek Olympic baseball team. Well, when they say it's the International League, they mean it, don't <laughs> they? And with the Royals chain, we mentioned with Milwaukee, Boston, signed a minor league contract with the Indians, which brought him. To Columbus. You know what's amazing? A lot of these guys are on the 40 man roster. Yep. When you're on the 40 man roster, you're automatically making pretty good money. And then you'll have a split contract. So if you do go to the big leagues, it's retroactive. But there are guys down here, as we have seen, making as much as seven million playing in the minor leagues. And there's a lot of them on this field tonight that are making forty thousand as high as maybe two hundred and fifty thousand. Potteris in 2013 signed a one year deal with the Cubs for just more than a million, but was released in March of 2014, which brought him to Columbus and the Indians. Uh oh. Down the line, high and deep. Over the mini green monster for the home run. He not only ties the game, he gives Columbus. A one run lead. Did you hear the difference in the sound of that? Absolutely. Ball? Well, George Cotter is the number nine hitter in the order. Give a listen. Yep. Yeah, that's just crisp and clear right there. You know he's got enough of it to get out of the park. After trailing the entire ball game, Columbus takes a 5 4 lead. This would be considered a slugfest between these two teams. Absolutely. They split two early in the year. Each team shut out the other. Columbus averaged less than two and a half runs against. Durham in that series and you know last year they were just a uh, they averaged less or maybe it was 2.3 one year and then last year 
So they have just had a history of not scoring much against this team. Gomes in 09 led all of minor league baseball with 65 appearances. Originally taken by the Padres in 07, the 17th round out of Tulane. Jose Ramirez doubled back in the first inning. A couple of fly balls since. Tampa Boy. Bay picked up Gomes back in 2010 in a trade with the Padres. Oh, that one's crushed, but it'll stay in the ballpark. Mikey Matuk runs it down. So another big fly for Columbus. One of them got out. And this is what it looked like. We know how it sounded. Here's another look. Cotteris with a man aboard gives Columbus a 5-4 lead here at Huntington Park, the minor league game of the week. We are back at Huntington Park where it's just a lot of ways to have fun. <laughs> and who would have thought Winnie the Pooh would just be that brutal, but you do what you got to do. Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn, Lauren Gardner, we're joined now by the, the founder of the feast, Ken Schnocky, president, general manager. I've got a, if I were wearing a cap, I'd tip it to you. Just an incredible ballpark. We love the open air press box, but more than anything, we love the many, many ways and Lauren's been showing them off for fans to have fun at your ballpark. You got to be like a kid on Christmas morning every game. I keep pinching myself that, you know, <laughs> I, I really get to do this. Uh, you know, I never thought this was going to happen in my lifetime, let alone my tenure. And about 10 years ago, this movement started to, you know, the Clippers to move from the old ballpark. And it took a number of years to decide on this site. And then we got into the development and we just told everybody we want to break the mold. We we want to build the next Camden Yards, not the, you know, the last Comiskey Park, because that was the huge change yeah. in, at the major league level with architecture and how you address the ballpark. Well, you told me that designers began to pull up renderings of different ballparks you said lose all that stuff Put them away yeah. don't even open them tell me about your thought process there well you know we just wanted to do things completely different and being in baseball you know, a long time this is my 38th year with the clippers you know we, we kept started thinking of the iconic ballparks and you think of you know the the green monster in Fenway and and Camden Yards with the left field building and the rooftops on Wrigley and we wanted to model that so you know we were kind of limited because this is less than eight acres so you know we got a lot of stuff in the five pound bag <laughs> if you will. <laughs> and well, it, did it did it turn out the way you'd hoped. Yeah it did I mean you'd lay awake and dream and and when it finally got here this was the dream realized. We've talked about this being as nice as any ballpark we've ever been. Uh, I love the fact that there are no bad seats anywhere. We, we tried not to do that and we tried to give you many different ways to view the game because with 18 natural intermissions uh, you can use that. I remember and you and I talked earlier and you remember in the old days if you sat on the third baseline you were looking out towards second base and you were you had to you get through the game and your neck would be sore or you'd pull a muscle. <laughs> now you've got everything angled where you can sit comfortably any place in this ballpark and enjoy the game. You can and you know that's kind of a new feature that has come to all of professional baseball within the last five to six years. So it's still hard for me to believe this is the sixth year. I still think <laughs> of this is a new ballpark. Well it looks new. It has that new ballpark smell. But uh, the uh, the thing we talked about during batting practice today was the fact that you're now part of the Indians chain and you're so close to Cleveland but you've been here as you said for 38 years. How interesting was it when this was part of the Yankees chain and George Steinbrenner was selling players and moving players and, and just was bigger than life. Every day I wanted to come to the ballpark because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And actually I've been like that all 38 years. The, and Doug can attest the great thing about the game of baseball. It's never the same. Amen. So every day is a different day. 
And, you know, with George Steinbrenner, we had some pretty interesting things. I mean, I could tell a story uh, about a pitcher named Dave Weirmeister oh, yeah. who got to go to the show. Well, George called and he wanted Dave Weirmeister. I had gotten him and his family passes. They were out at the Ohio State Fair with 30,000 people. I sent my entire ground crew to track him down. He had some kids, so I started in the kids section, and they found him, and he thought someone, some of the players were putting him up for a joke. So they, they took him to a pay phone, and they had him call me, and I had to swear to him on the Bible that this was not a joke. And he said, you know, he felt bad about his family. I said, Dave, one of the guys will bring you through because George says, if you're not in the bullpen tonight, there's going to wow. be a price to pay. Oh, wow. We'll leave somebody with your family, and that's exactly what we did. My goodness. I tell you, you got a good-looking ball club here as well this year. We do. I'm impressed with the way uh, we, we, we talked early about all these pitchers coming in. Just every one of them throw 95. Hold that thought. We're going to. Stay put, Ken. We have a lot more questions for you. We'll take a break. Three up, three down, nothing across for Columbus. It's a 5 4 Clippers lead. Back with more of the minor league game of the week on the CBS Sports Network. That's a good look at Jason Kipnis, the young man with a red hoodie in the Columbus dugout down here in a rehab assignment. We're talking with Ken Schnocky, president general manager of the Columbus Clippers and he's just one of the many talented players you guys have sent up to the bigs. He's having a wonderful major league career. He really is. He and Michael Brantley really stood out and you know Carlos Santana is part of that group and Corey Kluber, Kluber and Zach McAllister. I mean already in just the five years we have sent a lot of guys up that have become the core of the Indians of the future. Well, and Doug mentioned uh, you've got a nice looking ball club and you've got two nice looking rings on your hands. You guys have won a lot of games. It's a, and some championships. Good, That's nice. be, look at those things. This is double bling. These are our two national championships back to back 2010 2011 governor's cup girls hate it when guys have better jewelry than they do. <laughs> don't they? I hate it when I got a big league World Series ring and you got one better than me. <laughs> well this this is not just governor's cup. This is the national well, AAA true, championship yeah. back yeah. to back with Mike Sarbaugh who's now the Indians third base coach. Yeah. So. But no we do have a good looking club and you know, as you as you send people, as Doug knows, up to the big leagues, and sometimes you hit a little bit of a gap in the system. We've had that the last couple of years, but now we've got uh, Jesus Aguilar, 23 yeah. years yeah. old, good-looking first baseman, yeah. hits for power, hits great plate discipline, goes to all sides of the field, pretty good defensively. We just got the young third baseman Giovanni Urshela that just came up, 22 years old wow. from Colombia. These kids have some baseball instincts. You can see. Jose Ramirez, 21, the middle infielder, is, is another young man that has a very high uh, upside. And Jason Kipton, she talked about him. You know, he came out of college as an outfielder, yep. made the transition to second base. He joined us at the end of the 2010 season and was one of those spark plugs that came in in August mm. that really got us going to get to win the Governor's Cup and then go on and win the national championship. And man, he's just had a great start to his career with Cleveland. And he's become an all-star second baseman. Yes, he he's only yeah. played the position uh, less than four years. You gotta love the way he plays the game. Got a new pitcher in C.J. Riefenhauser, lefty, six foot, 180 pounder. Third pitcher of the night for Durham. And he's greeted by Urshela. Urshela with with That's right. See what happens when you talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's not enough to just have a great ballpark. What a huge help for business to have a great ball club to win ball games. It's more fun to come to the ballpark. It is. I mean, you know, in today's American society, uh, we too much we equate having a good time with winning. And of course, baseball is a game you keep score. So, you know, you do you do want to win. But even, you know, as many home games as we have, you can be 500 team at home and still have a championship caliber yep. team. Good point. We and know Al Aguilar, the aforementioned powerful man who is 0 for 2 tonight, though, with a walk. The years I got to manage and coach in the minor leagues, I always felt like it was more about developing these young men, not only as players, but as human beings, because the reality of it is the very few of them are going to get that opportunity now. Once they get the triple A's a little different, when I was down in the lower minor leagues, the reality is you've got to learn and teach them how to develop as young people without stealing the idea that they still have the dream to play. And uh, 
I think that's why when I look around at these people that are coaches at this level and have been doing it for 18 or 20 years, boy, my hat goes off to them because they have basically decided what they're going to do is help people get to maybe fulfill a dream that they never got to fulfill yeah. themselves. Yeah, and that's one of the things, I mean, I really did learn from the Yankees and George was the ideology that winning and player development go hand in hand. You can actually create a player who's good enough to get to the big leagues, happy enough to make the major league minimum and just wants to stick on the that's roster. Right. That's but right. to get a player like uh, Kipnis and Brantley and in the Yankee days, Jeter and Posada, they yeah. want to win at every level. That's right. That's a very special player, and the more of those that you can develop, the better your team is going to be. I got to ask you though, Kent, a, a guy with all the smarts that you have when it comes to baseball. You've been here for 38 years. Why so long in one place when I'm certain <laughs> you could have moved along? Well, it doesn't mean I'm smart. It just means I've been here a long time. <laughs> um, I got to think you've accrued a little bit of knowledge through those years. <laughs> It's by osmosis. <laughs> you know, some, I'm you on, love Columbus. I'm on, I love Columbus. My wife's from Columbus. And, you know, yeah, the grass is always greener. Yeah. I have some friends that got into baseball when I did. Some, A couple of them even became major league GMs. They're all either out of the game mm. or they're a part-time scout. That's all they're doing. Yeah. So uh, I'm feeling very comfortable Mac, and very lucky. Max Schumacher still over at Indianapolis, and he was there when I was there in 1974. Keep talking about guys that are older than me. <laughs> I, like I like that. Dave Rosenfield. Dave Norfolk, Rosenfield, that's right. Charlie Eschback in the Eastern League. And wow. David Cooper drew a walk, scored a run ahead of Gutierrez home run. Actually scored it on the RBI single by Rawlinger, who then scored ahead of the home run. Now you talk about a brave guy. David Cooper broke his back mm. about two years ago, and they weren't sure he was, this young man was ever going to walk again. Wow. And here he is back, you know, competing and playing competitively at the AAA level the and trying to get some you know, serious one more rehab. He really wow. was. Well, a lefty lefty matchup here with Riefenhauser out of Yonkers, New York. Played his college ball, small college down in Florida. Chipola Junior College drafted by the Rays in the 20th round in 2010. And whoever on your staff's in charge of weather, perfect job tonight. Runner goes. Mikey Ma took on the run, but that'll stay in the park. Ken, thank you so much and for Thanks, having guys. us. You're a wonderful host and a tremendous job of the ballpark. Thanks for coming to Columbus, and you need to hold on to this one run lead for me. All right, we'll, we'll do, do our do best. What we can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a break. Back with more from Huntington Park in Columbus. If you Bulls fans, we'll try to get you a couple of runs. Back with more of the minor league game of the week on the CBS Sports Network. Dick Gabriel, Doug Flynn in Columbus. Our roving reporter, Lauren Gardner, has located somebody who probably knows all the ins and outs of this ballpark and the clubhouse. Yes, George Robinson is basically in charge of all the operations behind the scenes at the clubhouse. He's so much more than a clubhouse manager, and he's also a native here of Columbus. George, you have been working here for 27 years. I think it's safe to say you're an institution. What has this experience been like for you? Oh, it's been wonderful. I mean, I get paid to come to the ballpark every day and work with these guys, and it's been great. It's been wonderful. I, I thank Mr. Shinaki for giving me the opportunity to work here. You were telling me some very interesting stories about your time here with the Clippers. Tell me about one of the most memorable moments that you may have had. Oh, the most memorable moment. Well, I'll tell you, the, the winning back-to-back uh, -back national championships was really neat. I don't know if, if you know, if that's going to happen again. So, You said you become a bit of a father figure for a lot of these players, uh, even putting them up in your own home sometimes. Yeah, I've had quite a few of them. I've got a couple this year, too. So, you know, if they need me, I'm there. I'm their nanny. Okay, one more thing. Talk about a very interesting time here at the ballpark. You said you had a heart attack here at the ballpark. You said you, you live and die by this place, and you mean that literally. Yeah, yeah, I did have a heart attack. Uh, I had 100%. My widow maker was blocked. 
And I really didn't want to go to the hospital because we had a game and, you know, I had to take care of my boys so to make sure that we got stuff done. So That is diehard, George. Well, I know that your efforts are greatly appreciated not only by the coaching Die. staff, but obviously by the players. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is diehard. That is a <laughs> tremendous story. Wow. wow. Well, clearly he got the proper medical help, but he had to take care of his boys. That is just phenomenal. Thanks, Lauren. And also, Lauren oh and I gosh. talked to him yesterday, and he was telling us about some other things he had done with some of these players. As we got a new pitcher in the game, C.C. Lee. Mikey Man. Ma took easily beats it out. Chen Chang Lee from Henghu County in Taiwan. And look at Mikey Mata getting down the line. And all the way over from second base rolling. A lot of range in this young man, but it's not enough time. Hey, we're seeing some guys in this ball game that can run a little bit. I mean, there's two or three guys that have beat out infield hits that, you know, look like they had a chance and they weren't even close. Well, that's the speed that made Ma took an all American center fielder at LSU. He covers a lot of ground in center field. Yeah. Now Wilson Bedemit, although you say he wants us to pronounce his name now more like they do in his native country. Beta me. All right, sir. Well, they better get through to the folks on the internet to make sure <laughs> that they change that. He's over two tonight, but did draw a walk. So on base now 35 of his last 39 games. Tying run at first base for the Bulls, not used to being behind in this one, but gave up a three spot in the sixth inning. After putting all the pressure earlier on Columbus, well, CC Lee coming with that three quarters motion. Yeah, which gives him a lot of sink on the ball. He actually throws his four seamer at 92 and his sinker at 93. And a brief trip to the majors up to Cleveland. Last year, eight games, went four and a third innings, and then had a brief stop earlier this year. Well, it was actually longer than last year, 14 games. Indians signed him as a non drafted free agent back in 2008. Spotted him in the World Baseball Classic. Played on the Taiwan Olympic team. Now rolls his head over his shoulders as he walks. Betamate. So now runners at first and second. And once again, Durham putting the pressure on Columbus. This time, though, the Clippers trying to hang on to a one run lead. Ooh. Yeah, not what you're hoping for when, because now you give them an opportunity to bunt. We see Dave Myers is going to run through some signs, maybe looking for a pinch runner for somebody. And in fact, that is the case. It's going to be Kevin Kiermeyer, backup outfielder, 6'1, 195. He's on the Tampa Bay 40 man roster. Port Wayne, Indiana native. Parkland Community College in Illinois. Boy, the guy's up now who's been swinging the bat pretty good. Couldn't imagine they'd want him to bunt. No, Jerry Sands doubled, scored a run back in the fourth, singled in the first inning. Fly ball to left, but he tagged it to end the fifth. As we said, he took an outstanding batting practice. He'd been struggling up to this game, but tonight looks pretty comfortable at the plate. Mm. Nasty pitch on the outside corner by Lee. And he jumps ahead, no balls, two strikes. Got him to chase. Three pitch strikeout for Lee. And now a double play will take Columbus out of the inning, trying to avoid that. Don't know. Slider, fastball, slider. And that's where you're supposed to throw an 0 2 pitch, right there. Good look at Lee. 
making just his fourth appearance in the minors this year. Coming into tonight's game, just four and two thirds innings. Six strikeouts, though. And again, off speed breaking stuff gets the outside edge. Goes from 93 to 83 with that slider. Boy, are you talking about a scouting report? That's exactly what they gave us. We've had a lot of fun talking to a lot of people tonight between. The folks who have dropped by to chat with us upstairs and Lauren out in the ballpark Jack Hanna. From the Columbus Zoo. I've already had more emails from people that said that guy looks like he'd be fun. Oh. Well if you see him on Letterman you know he is he's passionate about his work. And the great stories he told us. He goes the other way with it and that'll tie the game. Boy that was excellent hitting he got a slider. He tried to back door him. It's just a good piece of hitting. Second yeah, RBI question. for Belknap. <clears throat> Brings Mikey Matuk around. And it's a 5 5 game. Sometimes you just tip your hat. I mean, he had a good idea what he wanted to do. He wanted to backdoor that slider. He just waited and then drove it to left field. If he tries to pull it, probably hits it on the ground. It'll be a little while before we know if it made any difference, but Johnson missed the cutoff, man. Ushela did a tremendous job of laying out and stopping the ball as Justin Christian stands in. And what that did was it kept the runner at second and maintained a better opportunity for a double play or at least a force play for the Clippers. Yeah, he came up and just threw kind of wildly. And that ball may have gone on back past the catcher to the screen. Yeah. So your Shayla didn't assume anything. No. Well, <laughs> I think he knew he was lined up in pretty good position for the ball to go to the plate or to him at third base and when it was offline. And probably had his catcher screaming at him as well. Cut the ball. Mm. Slider just misses. One ball, two strikes. That's where Lee wanted it, though. Down and away, ahead in the count, 0 and 2. Christian slugging percentage, 402. On base, 743. Wow. Those breaking ball again. Moncrief, two out. So Lee is just one out away from. Stranding a couple of bulls, but they have scratched here in the eighth to tie the game at five. I hope Ken doesn't blame us for that. Well, I almost got on him because he didn't come over here until after they got the lead anyway. That's a smart move by him, though. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. It's like when we were in Pawtucket a few weeks ago and the fog was rolling in, but the manager <clears throat> never said a word to the umpires until they took the lead. Now that's the smart baseball. Mike Fontenot. Pair of singles struck out his last time up. 270 average, driven in 13. Go ahead run at second base. Native of Slidell, Louisiana. You hear the pop on it. that fastball by CC Lee. Good look at Fontenot. Yeah, this is a type guy that doesn't strike out a lot. And we'll put the ball in play the kind that. You know just pesky enough where he can drive a ball through the hole to knock in this go ahead run. Got a little piece of that slider. One ball two strikes. National freshman of the year at LSU another former Bayou Bengal. You would think with a name, name like Fontenot, yep. that it was a good chance. Part of that College World Series championship team of 2000. Ooh. Got him as he checked his swing. Lee works out of it, but he gives up a run. We are tied going to the bottom of the eighth. Columbus 5, Durham 5, minor league game of the week. CBS Sports Network.
Back in Columbus, a 5-5 game. Durham with big games from Mikey Matuk and a great performance, well, good performance anyway, by the starting pitcher, Annie Romero, and Moncrief and Kateris with bombs for Columbus. And here we are in the bottom of the eighth. All even up. They've gone back and forth here in the latter stages of this game. We thought we'd see a good one, Doug, and we have seen just that. Yeah, we knew it was good, probably going to be close. Just because the history said they wouldn't be scoring a lot of runs. And of course, one of the reasons, too, we've seen some pretty good pitching as well. well. We thought we'd see a close game, perhaps, as Doug said, because these teams did not score a lot of runs the first time they hooked up earlier this year. But that has not been the case tonight, as you can see. C.J. Riepenhauser still in the bump for the Durham Bulls, six foot 180. Jake Thompson down throwing again. He threw earlier but didn't come into the game. Now down just in case. Riepenhauser with 10 innings coming into this game, 12 strikeouts. He has struck out two already. Matt Carson will try to get on base for the Clippers. He did that leading off the second inning when he drew a walk. Came around, scored a run on the two run bomb by Moncrief. Riefenhauser gave up a single in the seventh inning, but otherwise, no damage by the Clippers. Carson, a native of Newport Beach, California. Trying to give him a lead with one swing right there. Got yep. a good look at a fastball and missed it. And he's gone yard five times this year. 17 RBI, 286 average. Claim straight away. Wind now blowing out to right. Take him away again. He's only six foot tall and 180 pounds, and which is normal size. But when you compare him with those six four and six five, and he's still throwing this thing at 90 and 91 mile an hour. See if he comes back with another heater or tries to throw him off speed. Tried to break one down on him. Two balls, two strikes. I tell you, it's still fun to try to guess with pitchers on what they're yeah. going to throw. You get beat on two straight fastballs, and then you come back with an off-speed pitch. And of course, if you throw it in the right place, it's good. But if you make a mistake with it, it speeds up that bat of the hitter. Two-two pitch. Looked like an errant breaking ball. Mm -hmm. So now the count is full as Carson battles back. What do you think, Coach? Heat? Oh, he's got to be. It's been his best pitch. I think he'll try to throw him a fastball, some maybe up and away a little bit. But he's shaking off a lot of pitches, yeah. so. Now that's why Carson backs out. Wants to. Well, you don't want to put the go ahead run on base. Carson wondering, will he get something to hit here? In the way of a fastball. He may try to run it underneath his hands. He's sitting right down low in the target. Nope. He just lost the last two pitches. You're right, Dick. He just lost it. Maybe trying to overthrow a little. Lead off man aboard. That's exactly what Carson did. Back in the second inning, drew a walk. Came around to score. Now Carlos Moncrief. You cannot imagine that. Obviously they would ask him to lay one down, although Jason Nix standing on the edge of the grass. You know, with so that hole on the right side of the infield, do you start your runner? No, I don't think so. I think you just let him. Ah. Yeah. You know, they, what do I know? Well, the Reds the other day tried to make uh, Neftali Soto bunt. He probably hadn't bunt 10 times in his whole life. It ended up. 
you know, not getting the ball down. And then so sometimes even though it's the right move to make, if you've got a guy who's not used to bunting, then you're almost giving up in that bat. Yeah. Of course, the sabermetricians hate the bunt. <laughs> this time of the ball game, the situation, it does call for that. And it turns out to be a good one by Moncrief. Yeah. Running on the inside of the baseline, though, which is dangerous. I tell you what, that pitch that's inside, you can usually handle it pretty good. And that's what they do. They busted him inside the fastball. He was able to lean back and bunt it to third base perfectly. Look at him celebrate with his teammates. Yeah, they appreciate that. That's good. You got to wonder. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what he was describing. Coming right at his face. Yeah. And he got it down. And that's a guy, like I said, power hitter but they asked him to lay one down and he got it done. Is that our own Lauren Gardner there in the dugout? She's been all over the ballpark. Why not? So now another pitching change for Durham. The go ahead run. Guys Moncrief was joking as he came off from being uh, out there at first base he said I just squared up closed my eyes and hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> well that was the best that was a very good bun and he got it done. Dave Myers makes the trudge. Yeah I'd be curious to know how many times he's been asked to, to bunt in his career. Yeah. Dave Myers the hitting coach is the manager acting manager tonight and we'll take a break. We'll come back to tell you all about the new pitcher in just a minute. We're tied at five. Bottom of the eighth in Columbus. Minor league game of the week here on the CBS Sports Network. Good look at Jake Thompson, the new pitcher for Durham. From Downey, California, played his college ball at Long Beach State. That's where he was drafted in 2010 by the Tampa Bay Rays, second round. Couple of appearances in the series against Louisville coming into this eight game road trip. And he faces Ryan Rawlinger here with one out and the go ahead run at second here, bottom of the eighth inning. Well, Ryan having a nice night. We heard Tim Belcher say that he plays all over the place. He's just a good, good, solid player. RBI single in the sixth inning. Part of that three run uprising that gave Columbus its first lead. Doubled back in the second, drew a walk in the fourth. Now he jumps ahead in the count, Jake Thompson. Making his 11th appearance, one save, 17 in the third innings, 14 strikeouts. Is walk four. Runner goes with a huge oh. jump. Wow, you could see that coming, man. He he kind of baited him the pitch before that. Got a little walk and lead. Realized he wasn't checking him out. This time, not Look at even, that jump. Wow, I mean he's halfway before he even takes off. Yeah, that's a fundamental error by the pitcher, Matt Carson. 90 feet away, one out. Woo! Hello. We used to call those ugly finders, especially if they were hit in the dugout. <laughs> it got his bat, though. A little fastball on the inside. Carson drew a walk, stole second. Watch this ball get in his kitchen. Yow! Yeah. Or rather, sacrificed a second, stole third. Had them scattered down in that dugout. So now a fly ball deep enough would give Columbus the lead. Infield all the way in on the edge of the grass. Hitters count. Got a good one. Wow, he got a good pitch to hit. That's when you just mm, fouled it straight back. 
And we'll see how he pitches him now. If he comes back with a fastball or tries to get him with an off speed pitch. He really doesn't hurt him if he walks him. That way he sets a double play up. Yep. Number nine hitter on deck. Chased one upstairs. Two out. George Kateris now will try to pick him up, and this is what he did the last time up. Launched one into the Columbus Knight just off the wall down the right field line. And that gave his ball club a short lived lead. Now he can drive in the go ahead run again. Two run shot. With a man on third and two out. Well, I'm sure going retreats. over how they're going to pitch him. On deck, you have Jose Ramirez, who was just sent down and obviously had been swinging a very hot bat with a double tonight. The terrorist two strikeouts prior to that home run. This is why managers get paid decent money is to make decisions like this. This is the fourth different pitcher he has faced tonight. Thompson 6'2, 225. Finds the outside edge. You could hear the pop on that mitt. Wind has picked up even more now, blowing out the right center. 1 1. Blew it by him. You know, it looks like he's got that good fastball at. 93 plus the pitch before that was his changeup at 83 along with the slider Thompson one strike away from working out of a big jam <laughs> Lee makes the call and the grab and the Bulls dodge a big one Columbus puts a man at third with one out but can't get him home and we'll go to the ninth tied at five Final League Game of the Week, CBS Sports Network. We're in the ninth, tied at five, Durham and Columbus here at Huntington Park. If you want stat scores, news, and video highlights for 160 minor league teams in the palm of your hand, get MILB First Pitch, the official app for minor league baseball, available now on Apple and Android devices. Visit MILB.com slash mobile to download the app today. You saw the highlights earlier that we had the headlines you'll understand why you need to keep up with news from MILB. A lot of great things happening on the minor league level and a good game tonight here in Columbus. Tough break for Kurt Casale a check swing strike. Sack fly back in the fourth. Otherwise a rough night double play caught looking but. Sacrifice fly gave his team a 4 2 lead. His way back in the fourth inning. Good pitch on the inner edge. Disappointing eighth for Columbus. A good sack bunt, a stolen base, almost a free base. As a runner stole third without a throw. They couldn't get him home. Well, you know, there's a lot of teams struggling with that right now, hitting with runners in scoring position. And sometimes you tip your hat to the guys that are out there on the hill. Woo! That ball was smoked. Number nine hitter leads off with a base hit. Casale went the other way with it, found that hole on the right side of the infield. Inside out right here. Went with it where it was pitched. So now we'll see at the top of the order, Hak Ju Lee is asked to bunt. Rochela in several steps at third. They look for that double play up the middle just in case. Yeah, you got to think they're going to bunt. Which he does, but not very well. The 
Sally played it smart and avoided the double play. One down. Well, let's watch his form right here. He gets ready to bunt. He's got the bat almost back behind him. What you'd like to see is for him to get that barrel up above the ball and the bat out in front just a little bit more. CC Lee still in the bump for Columbus. He got a good pitch to bunt to. That was add up over the plate. It, it was, was not, perfect. Not run in on him like Moncrief's bunt. So now Jason Nix will try to at least move the runner. He doubled back in the first inning, scored a run. 0 for 3 since. You know, I tell you, I've been very, very impressed with the pitching. Well, we thought we might see a pitcher's duel from the starters, and they pitched well. But all the relievers have done well, too. They've all acquitted themselves well. Yeah, all the guys that have come in have done a great job. You know, it's. There's so many of these kids today that are quality pitchers. And when you look at the big leagues, it just tells you how good they are when they're staying up there and they're in a rotation. Then you take a guy like Mike Leak, who's 5'10 and weighs 160 pounds. That's pretty impressive. Nick's 5'11, 195. Part of the Team USA effort in 2008 Olympics. On a bronze medal. His brother Lance played for the Rangers, Brewers, Reds, Nationals, and Phillies in a 10 year major league career. How cool would that be to have family playing, and even if you get to play together? You knew the Griffies, the father son combo. Yeah, that's just really weird. How great would it be to call your dad in the middle of the night and say, you know, I'm just in a slump and I can't get out of it? What do you think? <laughs> well, they do. They're very close. That family is. Breaking ball slapped into left center field. The Sally makes a turn, but that's where he will remain. And now. More pressure from the Durham Bulls. And a mound visit for the Clippers. Both bullpens are staying busy right now. So the go ahead run at second now. So the manager, Chris Trimmy. To the bump and a new pitcher on the way. We'll tell you all about him when we come back. Two men on in the ninth. Back with more CBS Sports Network. A lot of the fans still hanging in there over the left field wall, enjoying a great baseball game. 5-5 five, five here in the ninth with their favorite team, the Clippers, in trouble. Runners at first and second, one out, and a new pitcher now for Columbus. That young man brought in Vinny Pistano. Out of Cal State Fullerton, and he has got some big time major league experience. In fact, in 2012, he set the Indians franchise record with 36 holes. Went up in 2010, stayed in the bigs in 11 and 12, back down in 2013, but spent part of that year in the majors. And in fact, had three appearances already this season in Cleveland. Yeah, he's got a good hard sinker, about 90 miles an hour. Little slider, two pitches. And his job right now is to get that ground ball with the sinker. Mikey Matuk singled, scored a run back in the eighth inning. Beat on an infield hit, came around. Go ahead, runner at second. One down. Good by him. Slide piece right there. Had him out front just a little bit. Yep. You watch this here, especially from that arm angle. The ball just sort of backed up. Ma took a two run double in the first. Batting 308. Mm. Just off the outer edge. 
You can see where he'd be kind of nasty on right handers. Mikey Matuk is learning that as we speak. <laughs> Well, he's a good looking player, though, isn't he? Mato. Again, got to see him play in college and just a great athlete. Does a good job of fouling that pitch off. That's what protecting the plate with two strikes. You know, I've talked about that about every night, how it's become kind of a lost art. People don't shorten up their swing and try to put the ball in play. That time he does a good job of fouling it off. Astana with a couple of scoreless appearances last week against Syracuse. Got him a pretty good pitch to hit that time, but a lot of movement on this fastball and this sinker coming from Pestano. Nice to see another Irishman in the game. I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot Gabrielli. Big nice stop by Gutierrez. Vinny Pastano. That's that's a great name. You, isn't got it? It, you gotta like it. You've got Taiwanese represented, the Koreans, the Greek with Gutierrez behind the plate. It's wonderful. Dominican? Yep. Puerto Rican. Venezuelans. Oh, he missed it and he knows it. Yep. Deep to left, Elliot Johnson. Runners tag. They're going to move up on the deep fly ball, but Mikey Montuk knew he had a pitch he could drive. Well, that time, Elliot Johnson wasn't sure exactly where to throw the ball. And, you know, you got to come up and at least keep the force. You got two runners in scoring position now. The way he went after that ball, he got in the wind and started carrying it over towards center field, but he still had a chance to make a good hard throw into second to keep that runner at first. Well, now second and third. Here comes another mound visit. This will be whether they want to yep. walk. Betterman. Well, Betterman, I think, is out now. Kiermaier is yeah, in the right. game. Or Kiermaier is in the game. Came in as a pinch runner. But if you walk him, then you pitch to Sands, who's had a pretty good night. With the bases loaded. So they will pitch to Kiermeyer. They like this matchup. Game is tied at five. Second and third. Two down. Boy, that was a got a nasty breaking ball, but if he gets a pitch, a fastball he's looking for, he had the corners were back a little bit. That might have been something good. You only need one run right now. Now they're both in. That will untie this game in a hurry. So Kiermaier cleans the bases and now we'll go to third on the throwing arrow. Takes a look at the plate. But he'll stay right there. And it's a 7-5 Durham lead. That rattled. Ball was almost mini out of the monster. Park. Yeah, yeah, it was. Look almost how close gone. he came. Boy, that's just he gets that foot up, gets it down good, and I mean, just smokes it. And he's just a couple feet of a home run. About hit Wendy's right between the eyes. <laughs> what if you win anything for that? So two in now, two out. Jerry Sands will try to extend the lead. You know, we've seen a pretty nice home run tonight. Actually, a couple of them, but that might have been the hardest hit ball we've seen. Yeah, that ball was smoked. We first hit it, I thought it was going to maybe short hop the wall, and then it hits almost out of the ballpark. Of course, only 318 down the line. It doesn't get real deep where Wendy's is. Jerry Sands is single in the first. Double score to run in the fourth. Bastano not happy with himself. You see him snatch the ball out of the air as it comes back from the catcher. Bullpen alive again for Durham. Oh. 
could not even catch up. Hands behind on the count, one ball, two strikes. Just missed the outer edge. 2 2. Well, that double served two purposes. Gave the team the lead and silenced the Clippers crowd. The buzz left the building. Well, there has been a buzz here all night, too. Sands with a good eye. Pitch just misses outside. You know, Durham came out, jumped out to that early lead, but when Columbus answered right away, the crowd stayed in the game, even when Durham took the 4 2 lead in the field. Yeah. And Pastano, as you can see, really upset with himself for giving up the double that gave Durham the lead. We'll step out, come back for the bottom of the nine. Columbus down to its last three outs here at Huntington Park. It's the minor league game of the week on the CBS Sports Network. Clippers down to their last at bats here in the bottom of the ninth inning, down two runs again. This has happened to them twice, and both times they've caught up and taken the lead. But Kirby Yates will have a lot to say about that. The International League leader in saves with 11. Look at that ERA. 19 innings, 26 strikeouts, 5'10, 195. Actually, was born in Hawaii. And upon his way on is Jose Ramirez. Doubled back in the first inning, one for four on the night. They didn't even hesitate about going to their bullpen to bring nope. him in either. Yates with a brother who spent part of five years in the bigs. I tell you that ball sounds Didn't hard, it? but it, I look up on the board it says 93 and wow. he looks like he's got a nice little easy delivery comes over the top. Good slider right there. There is almost daring Jason Nix to come in. Good look at Yates drafted as a free agent 2009 by the Rays. All star team last year mid season off speed and he chased it up in his eyes one out. That was a crafty pitch. Well. It's it's a fast it's a fast ball, but it look where the pitch is. I mean the pitch is over his shoulder. It's a it wasn't a 93 or 94 like he could throw, right. but it was a he took a little something off. Yeah, and then, but uh, just a bad pitch to swing at, especially when you're leading off the inning. Elliot Johnson trying to find his way on for the first time tonight. 0 for 4. Couple of strikeouts, couple of fly balls. Well, his record is very impressive over his last 30 appearances, where he's converted 28 of 30 saves. Those are numbers that will get you moved up. Yep. Another breaking ball. And a nice play by a fan. Off the facade. Johnson actually was on Tampa Bay's opening day roster in 08. Back and forth between AAA and the majors. AAA All-Star in 2010. Actually drove in the game when he hit in the All-Star game that year. Part of that Montgomery team in 2006 won the Southern League Championship. He was a player of the year in that league. So they like his skills. He's played a good left field tonight, but trying to find his way on. His team down two. 2 2. Wow. No way to catch up with that one. 
Back to back strikeouts. Yates is one out away from save number 12. You know, he throws that slider 82. Throws you a fastball at 90 or 91, and then when he's got to have that little extra, comes back with a 94 mile an hour. That's just nice to be able to go to the toolbox for that. It's kind of like that pro golfer that when he needs that extra 15 yards, he's got it there. <laughs> That's when I pull out the foot wedge. <laughs> Giovanni Ursela singled back in the seventh inning. Try to figure out Mr. Yates. Wow. Fastball up and away, slider back down. 83 miles an hour, so obviously well out ahead of that one. You know, when you've got that many saves and you've converted that many, you're not just a thrower, you can absolutely pitch. Yep. Hung that breaking ball. He absolutely did. So Shayla knew what to do with it. Now the double gives Columbus the tying run at the plate. Well, here's a kid who just came down from the big leagues. They like him. He's a surprise prospect, but just hanging breaking ball. Doesn't really do a lot, almost just sits there on the platter. That's why he's hitting third in the lineup. He yep. knows what to do with those pitches that get hung like that. They go a long way and they hit hard. So for the sixth time this year, Yates will pitch with a man in scoring position. He's allowed just one run in that situation. Aguilar will try to make it two. Walked in the first inning. A couple of strikeouts popped out to first base. Clipper fans would say he's due. Back to back fastballs. Yep. Both on the outside corner. Clips down to their last strike. I'm guessing he was probably looking for something off speed or a breaking ball to take that pitch. Now you don't know what's coming. They just got to protect. Job by yep. Sally to keep that man at second. Though that run doesn't mean anything. That's when that pitcher wants to make the perfect slider. So he <laughs> tries to make it just throw it a little bit harder. Just a bit outside. Aguilar seven homers, 19 runs batted in. Love to make it number eight tonight. Now perhaps with that in mind, Yates will take a break. Not sure why they boo in that situation. They just do. They, yeah, well, it's because you're playing at home. Exactly. Because you can. Yeah. You have to be exactly on the right page, pitcher and catcher. Oh yeah. In this situation, Absolutely. especially. One-two pitch. Mm. H thought it was over. They did a good job of laying off of it. That that is a very very good pitch. Bottom fell out of it 83 miles an hour. How he laid off of it is amazing. Yep. Shalo away to his lead. Boy, good job of fouling that pitch off. You had to figure he'd come back with a heat 94 <laughs> miles an hour away. Yeah, on the outside part of the plate, too. May have been outside, but you can't take a chance with two no. strikes. Aguilar did a great job. But so did Yates. Can't let that pitch go by. This is why this game is so beautiful, man. He, <laughs> man in scoring position, it's just you and the pitcher. Wow. Busted him inside with a fastball, and Yates nails it down again. His 12th save of the year, and Durham comes into Columbus, first game of a road trip, and beats the Clippers 7-5. Yates, three strikeouts in the ninth. But just we saw just a clinic right there, pounding him away. First or two fastballs when he was obviously looking for a breaking ball. Threw him another one that he fouled off, and then busted him underneath his hands, which is just an impossible pitch to hit. 
Yates had to be wondering as well after the double by your Shayla, but he really bounced back against one of the toughest outs in that lineup. Well, and credit to this Durham Bulls team. They uh, took a nice lead. They get behind. And then uh, all of a sudden they come back. And they take the lead again. Did a great job of battling in this game, and there was some outstanding pitching. Bulls jumped out 2 0. Columbus tied it at 2. Durham takes a 4 2 lead. Columbus takes the 3 4 lead. They tie it up and win it in the night. And Lauren's got one of the heroes. Lauren? Well, thank you, Dick. Well, Kevin, you let this thing come down to the ninth. You face Vinny Pisano, who has that pretty good sinker. What were you looking for from him? I was just looking for a pitch to drive right there. Uh, you know, I got down 0 1, and I didn't want to try to do too much with it. And uh, thankfully, I got a good pitch to hit, and I took advantage of it. That was probably the hardest hit ball we saw all night. How good did that one feel? Yeah, it felt good. <laughs> um, you know, I don't get much for pinch hit situations or anything like that. And uh, to take advantage of uh, a pitch like that felt really good. And, you know, I barreled it up, and that's all you can ask for in that situation. And on the other side of things, talk about the way your pitching staff performed tonight, especially in Ennis Romero and, of course, the under that bullpen. Yeah, they did a great job, and uh, they did enough to, to you know, keep us in it and let us have a chance there and to win the ninth and and we got it done. Thanks a lot, Kevin. We appreciate the time. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Lauren. Kevin Kiermeyer with a game winning double in the top of the ninth. We'll come back and wrap things up here at Huntington Park in Columbus. Durham a winner over Columbus seven to five on the minor league baseball game of the week. Durham wins it here in Columbus by a final of seven to five. We've talked all night about a terrific ballpark, a great crowd. They went home disappointed. They saw a good game, though, Doug, and we thought we would. We just didn't think we'd see this kind of offense, as we mentioned several times. But uh, both times these teams got down, they rallied each time. Yeah, they did. Uh, you know, I think the bullpen came in for Durham, and they used a lot of pitchers tonight, which turned out to be, I think, the key to the game. That and the fact that when the Clippers had a chance to take a lead, they didn't and weren't able to do it man on third and they had one out and they weren't able to get that runner home that could have given them the lead going into the ninth which may have changed everything and you mentioned more than once guys who have been up want to show that they're worthy of going back guys who haven't had a shot yet want that chance we saw a lot of both tonight yeah there's some good talent out here and these are guys that we will be seeing in the big leagues pretty soon that'll do it from Columbus final score Durham wins at seven to five now for Doug Flynn Lauren Gardner our entire crew I'm Dick Gabriel for scores highlights features and more go to CBS sports.com be sure you join us next Thursday May 29th as the Memphis Redbirds play host to the Iowa Cubs 8 p.m. Eastern on CBS Sports Network this has been a presentation of CBS Sports Network the 24 hour home of CBS Sports that's it so long from Columbus on the CBS Sports Network.